the Nintendo Iceberg is absolutely huge. As you can tell by the runtime of this video, it is a behemoth. I found this iceberg image on Reddit from user Demnux, who was kind enough to let me bring their creation to video explanation. And that's exactly what I'll be doing today, explaining this iceberg which over the last three months has haunted and tormented me. There are around 140 unique Nintendo series on this iceberg, and hundreds upon hundreds of different games to actually discuss within those series. From the most well-known and mainstream franchises in gaming as a whole, to some of the most obscure and bizarre video games Nintendo has ever published, this iceberg covers a damn few of them. With a 31,000 word script, over 100 Nintendo tracks played throughout, and over two hundred pieces of footage assembled. I've tried my best to put together something really worthwhile here, but I think that's enough yapping for now. Time for us to dive into this iceberg and uncover Nintendo's darkest series. Super Mario, a game series that really, truly needs no explanation. Super Mario is not just one of the biggest IPs in gaming, but one of the most recognisable and successful fictional properties of all time. It's Nintendo's flagship title, featuring their mascot, the titular running and jumping capped plumber in red overalls, Super Mario. What started in 1985 as a simple but revolutionary side-scrolling 2D platformer for the NES, eventually grew into a sprawling, illustrious game franchise of 2D platforming quests, grand 3D adventures, sports games, racing games, RPG games, dance games, game making games. All of them following our red plumbing protagonist, his green clad wimpy younger brother and a whole host of supporting characters on Mario's mission to save his beloved Princess Peach from the clutches of Bowser and his evil forces. From its birth to present day, Super Mario has become the single highest grossing video game IP of all time. If we are including all official mainline and spin-off Mario games, the franchise has accumulated over 832 million copies sold across all games. A unit that is absolutely unfathomable. The most recent Mario release is Super Mario Wonder, which will have released by the time this video comes out on a scheduled 20th of October 2023. And I have absolutely no doubt Nintendo intends to continue continue their flagship franchise with many more installments down the line. The Legend of Zelda the legendary tale of the hero of time, Link, a young Hylian boy, and the magical princess Zelda, the reincarnation of the goddess Hylia, as they fight to save their land of Hyrule from the evil demon king Ganon, and his plans to use a sacred relic called the Triforce to achieve his villainous goals. What started in 1986 as an action-adventure dungeon-crawling RPG game for the NES, went on to become one of Nintendo's lushest and most expansive game franchises, having lots of 2D games adapting on the original format, several spin-off titles, and of course, a wealth of 3D action-adventure epics across multiple consoles. Most popularly and successfully of which being the Nintendo Switch's Breath of the Wild, having Link venture across the first open-world setting of the series, a game that garnered massive commercial and critical acclaim. The most recent Legend of Zelda release was this year's The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, and I don't think this series either will be slowing down anytime soon. Pokemon. So Mario was the highest grossing Nintendo franchise solely in terms of video game sales, but Pokemon is the highest grossing media franchise, not just of Nintendo, but of all time, beating Mickey Mouse, Star Wars, and every other video game property ever, with an estimated $150 billion growth. The Pokemon franchise consists of countless video games set in a world where the human players coexist with creatures called Pokemon that you can catch, train, and battle other trainers' Pokemon with. Each new mainline installment of the franchise, which usually release in pairs, with each version having its own exclusive story elements and Pokemon, will introduce over 100 new Pokemon for the player to battle with and train. The games having a strong emphasis on collecting all the 
Pokemon, hence the iconic slogan, Gotta Catch Them All. Starting in 1996 with Pokemon Red and Blue for the Game Boy, the franchise was an instant smash hit, going on to spawn its own globally popular anime and trading card game, and games both mainline and spin-off that have been in production up to present day, and Nintendo definitely, definitely will not put an end to the Pokemon franchise anytime soon, with the most recent Pokemon releases being Pokemon Scarlet and Violet last year. Kirby. Developed by HAL Laboratory and published by Nintendo, Kirby is an action platforming game featuring the lovable pink puffball protagonist, well, Kirby. The series centres around our cutesy hero saving his home planet of Popstar from a variety of threats using his signature ability, inhaling enemies and gaining their powers and appearance for his own use, called a copy ability iconic. Starting in 1992 with side-scrolling 2D platformer Kirby's Dreamland for the Game Boy, the Kirby series has gone on to include 39 games and has sold over 40 million units worldwide, making it one of Nintendo's best-selling franchises, sitting comfortably in the top 50 best-selling video game franchises of all time. The most recent Kirby release that wasn't a deluxe edition was Kirby and the Forgotten Land last year, which was actually the first fully realized 3D game in the series, and I hope to see many more in the future. Donkey Kong. The franchise that originally launched Nintendo into business, Donkey Kong is one of Nintendo's oldest and most prosperous series. The DK debut in 1981 with the all-time classic arcade cabinet game Donkey Kong was an astronomical success and is what first really put Nintendo on the map in terms of video game viability. Later in 1994, the Donkey Kong franchise saw its first big console platformer game with Donkey Kong Country by Rare, which went on to have two direct sequels by the same studio. DK then had a long 14-year hiatus until his return on the Wii with the masterpiece that was Donkey Kong Country Returns and its successor, Tropical Freeze. The series of course revolves around its namesake banana slamming protagonist Donkey Kong, as he platforms and fights to save him and his fellow Kong's home island from a variety of invading threats. The series sadly hasn't seen a real mainline installment since Tropical Freeze in 2014, even though it's one of the best realised 2D platformers in the industry. But there have been whispers across the online gaming sphere of a new DK game being in the works as of late, so we can only hope. Animal Crossing. Beginning in 2001 with its first installment of the same name for the GameCube, Animal Crossing is one of Nintendo's biggest franchises, but one that doesn't focus on grand platforming adventures or epic narratives, but watering plants, saying hi to your neighbours and enjoying nature. Animal Crossing is a social simulation series where you, the player, are a human character living in a village or island with loads of anthropomorphic animal neighbours that you can interact with while you do lots of fun little activities like fishing and bug catching. The game is notable for its open-ended gameplay and use of the video game console's internal clock and calendar to simulate a real passage of time. It's a franchise that is deceptively popular, with its most recent mainline release, Animal Crossing New Horizons for the Switch, which having sold around 43 million units. And seeing it was as lucrative as it was, I'd be shocked if Nintendo doesn't already have plans to keep the series going well into the future. Mario Kart. The biggest and most successful spin-off series probably ever in the video game industry, Mario Kart is of course the iconic multiplayer kart racer using the Mario Universe items and characters throughout each game. Each game focuses on frantic go-kart style races, with up to 12 racers blasting each other with power-ups like fireballs and blue shells across the vibrant vistas of the Super Mario Universe. Starting in 1992 with Super Mario Kart for the SNES, the series has continually been updated and developed with seven more mainline installments. Each one introduced Introducing new characters and tracks, while also remastering past ones to create the definitive multiplayer party kart racing game. Very fun to just whack on when you're with your mates for a race or two. The most recent full Mario Kart game was Mario Kart 8 Deluxe for the Nintendo Switch. Splatoon. Possibly one of the most creative and aesthetically unique AAA games in the video game world right now, Nintendo's Splatoon, despite the franchise only beginning in 2015, has come to be one of the most popular series in modern gaming. Splatoon itself is hard to really describe, with its blend of multiplayer team battles, single player platforming and puzzle solving, and co-op style horde modes. But to put it simply, Splatoon is a third person shooter revolving around the society and conflicts of the half-squid, half-human, colourful ink-shooting protagonists, the Inklings. 
things. The game has a very unique playstyle, with the player being able to switch between a walking humanoid and a swimming squid at any moment for some of the most dynamic and fun movement of any Nintendo game. Each game and DLC advancing the surprisingly deep lore of Splatoon's post-apocalyptic Earth with new storylines, the most recent of which being Splatoon 3 for the Switch, with a new DLC expansion for it, Side Order, being planned for a spring 2024 release. Yoshi. Another series that is technically a Super Mario spin-off, recurring character Yoshi from the Super Mario franchise actually got his own standalone platforming title in 1995 called Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island. The game of course revolving around green dinosaur Yoshi as he platforms alongside baby Mario in order to reunite him with his brother Luigi who's been kidnapped by Kamek. Yoshi then saw his own fully self-titled game with Yoshi's story for the Nintendo 64 and has had his share of somewhat niche platformers ever since. They all became came aesthetically focused on arts and crafts in recent times though, for whatever reason. Nothing wrong with that, they look pretty cool, just uh, why? The most recent Yoshi game is 2019's Yoshi's Crafted World for the Nintendo Switch, and I hope this series continues to see the light of day. Wii the Wii series, as the name suggests, is an eclectic assortment of simulation games that started in 2006 on the Nintendo console the Wii. Each game takes a different subject matter into focus, whether that be sports, music, exercise, party games, or even chess, and use the iconic Wii avatars, the Miis, as the playable characters and NPCs in the in-game world. Except for Wii Chess. There are no Miis in Wii Chess. Only chess pieces. Revolutionary gameplay. The franchise of course naturally reached its peak in the Wii era, with the astronomical boom in popularity of the console itself, and the franchise's very casual and accessible nature which made it a surefire recipe for success. With the original Wii Sports even being bundled with the console itself and reaching 82.9 million units sold, with its successor Wii Sports Resort reaching an equally astounding 33.14 million considering it was a standalone title this time. However, given the series was very much a product of its time, its popularity has dwindled to zero as time's gone on, with the most recent mainline instalment of the Wii series being Wii Fit U for the Wii U in 2014. Fire Emblem Fire Emblem is a Japanese fantasy tactical role-playing game franchise developed by Intelligent Systems and published by Nintendo. First produced and published for the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1990, the series currently consists of 17 core entries and 5 spin-offs. Gameplay revolves around the tactical movement and actions of characters across grid-based battlefields, while having a story and characters similar to traditional role-playing video games. The series was not released outside of Japan until characters Marth and Roy were included as playable fighters in another wildly popular Nintendo series I'll touch on soon, Super Smash Bros, which introduced Western audiences to the franchise. I personally have never played a Fire Emblem game and like many others only learned of it through the character entries in Smash Bros. The latest Fire Emblem game is this year's Fire Emblem Engage for the Nintendo Switch. Super Smash Bros. The single biggest crossover event in gaming history, Nintendo Super Smash Bros is one of the grandest video games in terms of sheer scope and cast ever. Directed by the creator of Kirby, Masahiro Sakurai, each Smash Bros game focuses on multiplayer platformer fighting gameplay unlike anything else in its genre, with players inflicting not damage to whittle down a health bar but to increase each other's percentage, a mechanic that increases the knockback from your attacks the higher it gets until you can blast your opponent off the screen to defeat them. Starting in 1999 with the original Super Smash Bros for the Nintendo 64, the game has gone from a humble cast of 12 iconic Nintendo characters to an overwhelming wealth of of over 80 unique characters scoured from all across Nintendo's history in gaming and a few non-Nintendo crossover characters. With the most recent entry in the series in 2018, the insanely hype Super Smash Bros Ultimate for the Nintendo Switch, which boasts a preposterous cast of 89 playable fighters, 115 unique stages to fight on, over 1,000 music tracks and an entire fully fledged single player campaign. Seeing as Ultimate was as, well, Ultimate as it was, I struggled to see a new Smash Bros game being released anytime in the foreseeable future, but who knows what Nintendo could have in store for us. Metroid 
An action-adventure game franchise created by Nintendo, Metroid follows the bounty hunter Samus Aran, who protects the galaxy from space pirates and other malevolent forces and their attempts to harness the power of the parasitic Metroid creatures. Metroid's gameplay features a blend of the platforming of Super Mario and the exploration of The Legend of Zelda, with a futuristic sci-fi space setting and an emphasis on non-linear gameplay. With its first entry for the NES in 1986, Metroid, the series went on to spawn several more 2D side-scrolling adventures and eventually some 3D games using a first-person shooter perspective. The most recent mainline Metroid game was 2021's Metroid Dread for the Nintendo Switch, and the release of the next game, the continuously prophesized Metroid Prime 4, could always be on the horizon, as impossible as that game is seeming to be. Earthbound Otherwise known as Mother inside Japan, Earthbound is a series comprised of three games. Earthbound Beginning slash Mother released in 1989 for the NES, Earthbound slash Mother 2 released in 1994 for the SNES, and ultimately the occult and elusive Mother 3 that was never localised outside of Japan, released in 2006 for the Game Boy Advance. Each game focusing on RPG combat encounters using items and psychic abilities to fight off an eclectic assortment of hostile enemies, and featuring exploration of a top-down overworld. The games feature an interesting aesthetic mix, with cartoonish and psychedelic elements overlaid across a narrative following the protagonist Ninten, Ness, and ultimately Lucas across the trilogy. With a story juggling the following themes, it's easy to see how a game as niche and obscure as this grew to amass such a profound occult fanbase. However, seeing as its last instalment was a Game Boy Advance game in 2006 that was never taken out of Japan, I think it's sadly quite safe to say this series isn't on Nintendo's top priority list for a continuation. Star Fox an arcade-style rail shooter and third-person action-adventure series following the undertakings of the Star Fox Combat Team, a task force of anthropomorphic animal spacecraft pilots led by chief protagonist and main character of the series, Fox McCloud, as they fight to defend the Lilat planetary system from overarching series antagonist, the evil scientist Andros. The original Star Fox released in 1993 for the SNES is a forward-scrolling 3D rail shooter but the series has granted the player more and more directional freedom as the mainline games have progressed, the most recent of them being 2016's Star Fox Zero for the Wii U. Excitebike Excitebike is a side-scrolling racing game developed and published by Nintendo for the NES in 1984 in which the player takes control of a motocross racer. There are two game modes, Selection A which is a solo race and Selection B which is a race against CPU opponents. The smooth side-scrolling game engine the dev team developed for Excitebike was actually later used to develop the first Super Mario Bros which had the effect of Mario smoothly accelerating from a walk to a run rather than move at a constant speed. The game was a commercial success and spawned a respectable lineage of sequels with the series ending off on the WiiWare title Excitebike World Rally in 2009. Ice Climber Developed and published by Nintendo for arcade systems in 1984, Ice Climber can be played either single or two-player, where either player will control one of two hooded Eskimo-like ice climbers, either Nana or Popo, as they scale 32 vertically scrolling icy mountains to recover these giant vegetables from a giant condor bird. Having only existed on arcade systems from 1984, it's hard to call this a series at all. In fact, the only reason most people even know about the Ice Climber characters is probably because of their miraculous inclusion in Super Smash Bros. As a playable fighter. But nonetheless, the series is fittingly on the iceberg, with just one installment in 1984. Pikmin One of Nintendo's most slept on franchises in my opinion, the Pikmin series centres around a blend of real-time strategy, puzzle solving and action platformer gameplay. Each game having the player navigate the Earth-like alien planet of PNF 404 as the titular Captain Olimar and a multitude of other explorers in later games, focusing on controlling a crowd of these creatures called Pikmin which you can throw and order around to deal with the indigenous species of the planet, collect treasures and fruits and defeat bosses. The game has had a run of four mainline games, all of which have seen respectable critical and commercial success, with one odd spin-off game for the 3DS, Hey Pikmin, which takes on a completely different side-scrolling playstyle. I know no one remembers you, Hey Pikmin, but I do. I remember you playing you on the 3DS. On the, the most recent Pikmin release was this year's Pikmin 4 for the Nintendo Switch. Kid Icarus A series of fantasy video games developed and published by Nintendo, the games are set in a Greco-Roman fantasy world called Angel Land, 
with a world loosely based on Greek mythology, and gameplay consisting of a mixture of action, adventure and platforming elements. The first instalment in 1986, Kid Icarus for the NES, released a critical success but poor sales and only saw one sequel in 1991 after it that being Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters for the Game Boy. Kid Icarus then went on a 20 year hiatus from Nintendo consoles, the series being revived with Kid Icarus Uprising for the 3DS in 2012, which adopted a 3D third person shooter style of gameplay and released to great critical acclaim and sold over a million copies. However, excluding appearances in Super Smash Bros, the Kid Icarus series hasn't returned since 2012. Game & Watch the Game & Watch series consists of a total of 60 handheld electronic video games that Nintendo manufactured and published between 1980 and 1991. Each Game & Watch title included one game on a handheld device, starting on April 28th with the first game, Ball, in 1980. A simple game requiring the player to juggle balls of increasing difficulty for as long as they can. Nintendo went on to publish more games, each focusing on their own unique minigame and objective like Chef, Pinball, and from the early to mid 80s and onwards, games focusing on other characters like Mario, Donkey Kong and Popeye. The last mainline Game & Watch release was Mario the Juggler in 1991. Punch Out! Punch Out! is a video game series centered around boxing and punching your way through the world's finest and most interesting boxers to climb the ranks of the World Video Boxing Association to ultimately become champion. Gameplay differs slightly between each game, but generally the player controls main character Little Mac, who can attack with his left and right fists at the head or the body of his opponent and can also dodge and block to avoid the opponent's attacks. The series has had a total of 8 mainline installments and versions, along with a handful of spin-offs spanning from the original Punch-Out in 1984, which was an arcade unit game actually featuring real-world boxer Mike Tyson as the final opponent, to the most recent Punch-Out release for the Wii in 2009, which was also titled Punch-Out. Bayonetta Developed by Platinum Games and published by both Nintendo and Sega, Bayonetta is a series of action-adventure games, following the trials and tribulations of dual pistol-wielding, magical transforming, hair-having, shape-shifting witch, Bayonetta. Each of the games feature third-person 3D hack-and-slash action as you fight off hordes of angels and traverse cityscapes and holy, chaotic, mystical set pieces. The series began in 2009 with the eponymous title and has seen two mainline entries since, most recently in 2022 with Bayonetta 3, and one spin-off this year with Bayonetta Origins, Seriza and the Lost Demon. Xenoblade Chronicles Xenoblade Chronicles is a sci-fi series of action role-playing games developed by Squaresoft initially, subsequently Monolith Soft, and published by Nintendo. The series began with the original Xenoblade Chronicles game published for the Nintendo Wii in 2010. With a series currently spanning four games, the Xenoblade Chronicle franchise focuses on quick-time action-based battle system gameplay and tells the story of two warring civilizations that exist each on the back of two frozen gods. Bionis, which homes the humans and Homs, and Mekon which homes the Mechon. And yes, I'm no Xenoblade plot scholar, but I think that pretty much summarizes it. The most recent mainline Xenoblade Chronicles release was 2022's Xenoblade Chronicles 3 for the Nintendo Switch. F Zero. F Zero is a series of high paced futuristic racing games which has been developed by several third party developers over the years and published by Nintendo. The games take place in a futuristic setting and are known for their difficulty, original soundtracks, and just genuinely being one of the fastest racing games on the market. Each of the games in the F Zero series require the player to beat opponents to the finish line of a racetrack while avoiding obstacles such as landmines and slip zones. The games usually require a mixture of memorization of the tracks and quick reflexes for its fast paced racing gameplay. The series began in 1990 with F-Zero for the SNES and was actually the first game for the system to emulate 3D environments, and has remained largely dormant since the release of F-Zero Climax in 2004, with little to speak of release-wise apart from a free-to-play Battle Royale title for Nintendo Switch Online released this year. Wario 
Another case of a Super Mario character getting their own spin-off platforming series, the Wario franchise consists mainly of two sub-series. The Wario Land games, which are all platforming games much akin to the Super Mario format, but of course featuring its own original host of characters, stages, storylines and gameplay gimmicks, with games that often focus on Wario journeying to find treasure, with gameplay consisting of platforming through levels, tossing enemies, breaking blocks and using other abilities. And then the second sub-series of Wario games, the WarioWare series, which are all basically quirky and random minigame collections having the player complete countless 3-5 to five second micro games in quick succession, with 4 lives that run out each time you fail one of these games. The minigames having really random objectives like zapping a spaceship, collecting coins in a Pac-Man like maze etc. The Wario series began with Wario Land Super Mario Land 3 for the Game Boy in 1994 and its most recent release is WarioWare Move It, which is scheduled to release by the time this video comes out on November 3rd, 2023. Rob The robotic operating buddy, otherwise known as Rob, was a toy robot device that was used as an accessory to the NES that Nintendo launched in 1985. Throughout its short lifespan, only two official games were published for Rob, both of which came bundled with physical parts slash toys intended for use in conjunction with the Rob hardware. Those being Gyromite, which came most focally with two two spinning tops called gyros which Rob could spin and switch between to move different coloured pillars out of the way in this little platforming puzzle game. And the second game was Stack Up, which came with five different coloured circular blocks which the player could command Rob to move and reorder them to match what was depicted on screen. Gameplay for this one looks absolutely riveting. Despite being such a huge success in the mid 80s, Rob never saw any more games past those two although four more were planned at some point in 1985 but were never released, and has only been featured since as a legacy character in series like Mario Kart and Smash Bros, and remains as one of Nintendo's most interesting pieces of hardware history. ARMS Developed and published by Nintendo and released in 2017 for the Nintendo Switch, ARMS is a fighting game that has unfortunately not seen any sequels since its debut game. The game features a very unconventional playstyle for the fighting genre, where up to 4 players can battle it out in 3D arenas controlling one of 15 titular ARMS fighters, each fighter donning this game's entire premise, having extremely long elastic stretchy arms the player can punch across a large distance with, using the Joy-Cons to simulate punching as control being able to unlock different arms and extra modes that have different effects and gimmicks. The game has multiple game modes, of course plenty of multiplayer versus modes, a single player Grand Prix mode and a variety of battle modes. The game did very well and has sold over 2 million copies since its 2017 release, and I guess we'll just have to see if Nintendo ever plans on bringing back arms for another instalment in the future. Duck Hunt Duck Hunt is a light gun shooter video game developed and published by Nintendo for the NES and arcade systems that was released in 1984. The game made use of the NES Zapper accessory, having the player point and shoot at their television and hit ducks and clay pigeons in game. The game has two game modes which both pretty much just go as I described, one shooting ducks and the other shooting clay pigeons. In both, the player has three attempts to shoot the on-screen targets when they appear. The game is memorable for this nameless character, which has gone on to be known as simple the duck hunt dog or laughing dog, notorious for smugly laughing at the player for missing ducks. And the character actually went on to appear in the Super Smash Bros. series as a playable fighter in Smash Bros. for Wii U and 3DS in 2014, but the series hasn't seen any fully fledged games since its 1984 debut. Electroplankton Released first in Japan in 2005 and later released in North America and Europe in 2006 for the Nintendo DS. Electroplankton is this sort of interactive music making game where the player can interact with one of ten of these plankton interfaces to create sounds and music, all with a relatively simplistic colourful aesthetic. It's a bit weird to explain so I'll just show this example, an example that you may actually recognise from Smash Bros.
The game offers two game modes, performance and audience. Performance mode allows the user to interact with the plankton through the use of the stylus, touchscreen and a microphone like I've described in order to create sounds. Audience mode is like a demo mode, which simply allows the user to put down the system and enjoy a continuous musical show by all of the plankton, although the user can still interact with the plankton just like in performance mode. The series has not returned since 2006. Brain Age. Otherwise known as Dr. Kawashima's Brain Training in Power Regions is a series of games consisting of mini-games with the purpose of strengthening your brain, training it even as the title says, and featuring the mascot character and sort of narrator to tie the games together, Dr. Kawashima. The mini-games often feature relatively simple but engaging objectives like solving some maths calculations in quick succession or counting how many people enter a little diagram house. These activities are usually presented in both a training mode where players can practice and get the hang of how the activities are played out and a brain age check mode where the user completes multiple of these mini games and activities outside of practice with the game estimating the player's brain aged based on how quickly they completed all the tests and accounting for any incorrect answers. The game then tracks a user's performance over time to help show the effects of daily interactions with the game. It's a series more so geared towards a more elderly demographic who could benefit from restrengthening their mental processes in a more digestible entertaining format. The series has had five installments from the original brain age train your brain in minutes a day in 2005 for the DS to Dr. Kawashima's brain training for the Nintendo Switch in 2019. Wrecking Crew So Wrecking Crew is another arcade game Nintendo published in the early to mid 80s, 1984 specifically, which went on to see a NES release the year after and one sequel in 1988. In the game, the player controls Mario or Luigi in two player versions and must attempt to destroy all of a certain set of objects with a large hammer on one of 100 levels the player can choose from. There are bombs, walls, pillars, ladders and other items both indestructible and destructible as well as enemies for Mario to avoid. The player starts the game with with five lives and loses a life whenever Mario gets damaged by any hazards. Wrecking Crew actually went on to see one sequel, Wrecking Crew 98 released in 1998 for the SNES and that's basically it. So considering the last entry was in 1998, I'm gonna go out on a limb and estimate the series may have died. Possibly, maybe, theoretically. Wrecking Crew may have been wrecked. Tomodachi Life Tomodachi Life is a social simulation game Nintendo developed and published for the 3DS in 2013. The game follows the daily lives of an island full of Mii characters. You can customise and personalise your own Mii's as they become the citizens of this island and interact with them and spectate as they forge their own friendships, romances, conflicts and everything else you can expect from a sim game. Just think of it as Nintendo's version of The Sims. The game runs in real time based off the... The game runs in real time based off the 3DS's internal clock, and so much alike Animal Crossing encourages the player to log in and interact with the Miis at different times in the day. As the game goes by, the player unlocks more locations, clothes, food and other things for the Miis to interact with, like items to give them and special interiors for their apartment. The game was received very well, as of March this year Nintendo has sold 6.72 million units of the game worldwide, which made it one of the top 10 best selling games on the 3DS. And I don't think it's too far fetched to say we could see another Tom Tomodachi Life game somewhere down the line. Famicom Detective Club Famicom Detective Club is a series made of two adventure games, developed and published by Nintendo for the family computer disc system, NES, Game Boy, and actually also have seen remakes on the Switch. The first entry, The Missing Heir, was released in 1988, followed by a prequel released the next year titled The Girl Who Stands Behind. In both games, the player takes on the role of a young man solving murder mysteries in the Japanese countryside, with gameplay that seems to feature relatively basic levels of interactivity. Looks like a mix of visual novel and like point and click adventure gameplay, with the player having to choose between dialogue options and scroll through menus to further the narrative. The series hasn't seen any new installments since The Girl Who Stands Behind in 1989, or any updates at all since their remakes in 2021. Balloon Fight Another one of Nintendo's early 80s arcade games, Balloon Fight has you control an unnamed balloon fighter, 
one of these little guys, or two of them in two player modes, who flies around in the air via the balloons attached to their helmets. By repeatedly pressing the A button or holding down the B button, the player can make the balloon fighter flap his arms and rise into the air, or if you stop pressing the buttons naturally, you will descend, while obviously using analog controls to move laterally. Defeating all of the enemies on screen will move you to the next stage. The series has seen five unique game installments, I believe, six if you count a sub-game in 2012's Nintendo Land, but since then the series hasn't seen any new installments past simply being ported to newer consoles, and at most has seen references in games like WarriorWare and probably most well-knowingly, a stage in Smash Bros. Wait, why is the screen filling up with balloons right now? What the hell? Wait, no, no. Sim City. Sim City, also known as Micropolis or Sim City Classic, is a city building simulation game which was originally developed by Will Wright of Maxis Studios and released for several non Nintendo platforms from 1989 to 1991. But a new version was developed by Nintendo and released on the SNES in August 1991 that has been ported to later Nintendo consoles also. Popular franchise The Sims is actually technically a spin off of this series too, so should The Sims as a whole be on this iceberg? No. Sim City looks like this, with you having a bird's eye view of your city. The game's objective is to create and design said city, develop residential and industrial areas, build infrastructure like power grids, collect taxes for further city development, and other general maintenance and development activities you can expect from these sort of games. Importance is placed on increasing the population standard of living, maintaining a balance between the different sectors of the city, and monitoring the region's environmental situations to prevent the settlement from declining and going bankrupt, or so says the wiki, I haven't played SimCity. So yes, despite SimCity not being developed by Nintendo technically, Nintendo did become a publisher of the game, which is what lands it on this iceberg. Wave Race. Wave Race is a series of games centered around jet skiing and racing across water to beat your opponent to the finish line of different water-based tracks, with power-ups, obstacles, checkpoints, and pretty much everything that is to be expected from a racing-type game along the way. The original Wave Race game launched for the Game Boy in 1992 and featured a very simplistic top-down perspective on the jet ski racing formula. Wave Race then made the inexorable jump to 3D with the second installment, 1996's Wave Race 64 for the Nintendo 64, which came with time trials, new single player modes, new tracks, characters and power ups along with the arrival of new three dimensional graphics and movement. The series then saw its latest and only other installment in 2001 with Wave Race Blue Storm for the GameCube which further developed the jet skiing formula of the Wave Race series. But despite each entry being met with critical and public acclaim, the series hasn't been revitalised at all since 2001. Devil World, a series consisting of just one NES game Nintendo published in 1984. Devil World is a game where you play as this green dragon called Tamagon, as you navigate a maze that is patrolled by monsters and filled with dots you must eat, very much in the same vein as Pac-Man gameplay-wise. Touching these crosses is what allows you to eat all the dots and defeat the monsters by breathing fireballs. There's this guy simply called The Devil, who dances at the top of the screen and will point in a direction for four of his minions to move the maze by using pulleys and ropes. You may recognise him from his assist trophy appearance in Smash Bros where he basically does the same thing. After the first maze is cleared, the next objective is to get four Bibles and put them into a seal. The Bibles give Tamagon the same powers as the crosses do, and after carrying them all into the seal, the devil flies to the next maze. In between, a bonus maze shows up where Tamagon can collect six bonus boxes under a time limit. The game actually never released in North America. Due to its devilish content, game journalist Chris Collar even went on to state it absolutely could not be released in America, because its satanic and religious imagery would be seen as unsettling or even blasphemous. The series has not been updated since. Golden Sun. The Golden Sun games are a series of fantasy RPG games developed by Camelot Software Planning and published by Nintendo. Golden Sun follows the story of a group of magically gifted heroes known as Adepts, who are faced with preventing the sealed away destructive power of alchemy from being released as it was in the past. Players navigate these characters through the game's fantasy world by defeating enemies and monsters, solving puzzles, traversing dungeons, caves and other locales, and completing assigned missions to complete the storyline in traditional RPG fashion. All the while using a multitude of special magical spells in both combat and overworld travel, like creating magical bridges to access new areas or as commands in battle of course. There have been three Golden Sun games in total. The first Game Boy Advance title, Golden Sun in 2001, Golden Sun The Lost Age in 2002, and ultimately 2000. 2010's Golden Sun Dark Dawn for the Nintendo DS. Rhythm Heaven The Rhythm Heaven series is a series of games centred around, well, rhythm. The Rhythm Heaven games are all essentially minigame collections, similarly to WarioWare, I suppose. 
Throughout the games, players must use the controls to play through several rhythm-based stages known as rhythm games, each with their own specific rules. The controls used include tapping the touchscreen, holding the stylus down on the touchscreen, dragging it across the screen and flicking it off the screen to play along and keep up with the rhythm in-game. The player is given a rank at the end of a game depending on how well they did, which ranges from try again for a poor performance to superb if they complete the stage with few or no mistakes. These rhythms are overlaid across pretty eclectic and, dare I say, quirky visuals, which I find pretty interesting, and the series is home to its own cast of characters, most infamously the Chorus Kids. The series started on the Game Boy Advance with 2006's Rhythm Tengoku, which was only ever released in Japan, before seeing its sequel Rhythm Heaven, which was released in 2008 for the DS worldwide. And two more titles were seen with Rhythm Heaven Fever in 2011 and ultimately Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix in 2015 for the 3DS. For Whom the Frog Bell Tolls. That is the proper English translation of this game, which was never released outside of Japan. It's an action RPG game developed by Nintendo and Intelligent Systems, and published of course just by Nintendo for the Game Boy in 1992. The game follows the tale of the Prince of Sable, the main character of the series who is a kind-hearted, innocent, heroic young boy, as he and another prince, Prince Richard of the Custard Kingdom, set off to rescue Princess Tiramisu, who has been kidnapped by Lord Delarin, who is apparently an evil snake who plans to round up all the frogs in the kingdom for a feast. And as is par for the course with these types of magical RPG quests, there are several side characters who aid and antagonize our heroes, like Jam, who's a thief, and Mad Scienstein, a man who works at Nintendo Incorporated, making gadgets and gizmos for our hero to use on his journey. As the story advances, the Prince of Sable gains the ability to transform from a human into a frog and a snake. Each of his three forms have their own special abilities. Gameplay features classic RPG battle gameplay, as you can expect from the genre, with items, different attacks and commands, etc as well as overall traversal and puzzle solving with a traditional RPG perspective and some 2D platforming when in dungeons, caves and specific areas. But the series is just this one game and hasn't seen any real love from Nintendo outside of an assist trophy in Smash since 1992. Chibi Robo. Chibi Robo is a series of 3D platforming adventure video games developed by Skip Limited and published by Nintendo. In the Chibi Robo games, the player takes on the role of the namesake protagonist Chibi Robo, a 10 cm tall robot that has this cable and plug for a tail. Gameplay revolves around 3D exploration and adventuring, navigating different areas across the games, initially a family household, then a park, and eventually spanning continents in the series' own weird 2D platformer 3DS spin-off, and collecting happy points. These points are a accumulated by completing various tasks from housework to helping solve the dilemmas of the house's family, cleaning up and revitalizing a park, and helping out with the numerous living toys and side characters of the series. Every action you carry out as Chibi Robo consumes energy, since Chibi Robo is a battery powered robot, so the player is required to recharge him using the electrical outlets. From the first installment in 2005 for the GameCube to the most recent 3DS spin off in 2015, the Chibi Robo series has seen a total of five games across its lifespan. And don't crucify me, but I actually did kind of enjoy Chibi Robo Ziplash. Don't tell anyone. Art Academy. This is a series of edutainment video games Nintendo began producing in 2009 with the initial Art Academy release for the DS. The games all focus on one simple concept, teaching the player how to draw, doing so with examples, like the game will show you a demonstration of someone drawing an apple and then it will make you draw an apple. Then it will add and explain shading to the illustration, then let you try to develop the drawing further and so on and so forth, until the ultimate goal of making the player a better artist is reached. The player of course using the stylus of either the DS, 3DS or Wii you to draw so. The series has seen a total of six installments since 2009, with its most recent release being 2016's Dylan's Rolling Western. Dylan's Rolling Western is the first title in the Dylan series, a three game series that has been developed by Van Poole and published by Nintendo. The series follows the protagonist Dylan, an armadillo ranger who's charged with defending his village from nightly invasions of these evil walking rock monsters called Groks, who attack his village from the vast barren stretches of the desert. He does so by rolling into them in traditional armadillo fashion, while also benefiting from the aid of these gun towers that act as a sort of tower defense style mechanic and can be outfitted with weapons to help defend against the Groks. 
get guns, Dylan must buy them, and sometimes he may have to build the gun tower himself first. In order to improve the village's defences, Dylan must collect materials by exploring mines and defeating grocks. The materials can then be used to build stronger doors for the village. The stronger a door is, the more difficult it is for a grok to get in. The first game launched as a purely downloadable title for the 3DS on the eShop in 2012, and despite receiving just mixed to average reviews, it went on to see two sequels, which both furthered the plot, narrative, character settings and gameplay of the series. Firstly in 2013, and ultimately in 2018, with the most recent installment, Dylan's Dead Heat Breakers. Fatal Frame, otherwise known as Zero in Japan and Project Zero in Europe and Australia, is a survival horror video game series created, published and developed by Koei Tecmo that has also seen some of its games co-published and released by Nintendo for Nintendo consoles. The series is set in 1980s Japan, with each entry focusing on a location afflicted by hostile supernatural events. In each scenario, the characters involved in the present investigation use Camera Obscura, objects created by Dr. Kunihiko Asou that can capture and pacify spirits. The the series frequently draws on staple elements of Japanese horror, and is recognised as one of the best known horror franchises in the industry, with its second instalment Fatal Frame 2 Crimson Butterfly even being renowned as one of the scariest horror games ever made. The titular first entry in the series, titled Fatal Frame, was released on the PlayStation 2 in 2001 and the Xbox in 2002, with the series I'm pretty sure not even being available on Nintendo platforms until the fourth entry in 2008, Fatal Frame Mask of the Lunar Eclipse, was published and made playable for the Nintendo Wii, with the most recent mainline Fatal Frame game, Fatal Frame Maiden of Black Water, being released for the Wii U in 2014. Joy Mech Fight Joy Mech Fight is a fighting game Nintendo developed and published for the NES in 1993 that was only released inside Japan. Plot-wise, the game follows the story of Dr. Emon, one of two brilliant scientists who remodels this mech robot Sukupon into a military robot in a last-ditch effort to stop his evil counterpart, the other brilliant but now evil scientist, Dr. Ivan Walnuts. And yes, this is Sukupon. You may recognize this from Smash Bros as an assist trophy, but this is supposed to be a mech and is the mascot essentially for the series and is one of 36 unique playable fighters in the game's roster. The game consists of a standard versus mode, single player or multiplayer just like every other fighting game ever, and a quest mode which is single player. In the quest mode there are about 8 enemy robots per level. Defeating the first 7 robots will cause the level's boss to emerge and defeating this boss will allow the player to move on to the next level. The game is completed by advancing through all 4 levels and the player will unlock new fighters as they defeat them throughout the campaign. So overall, pretty standard fighting game stuff, just with that peculiar Nintendo quirk to set it aside from other fighting games like Street Fighter or something. Nintendo Badge Arcade Nintendo Badge Arcade was this free-to-play downloadable app. I wouldn't necessarily call it a game that you could install for the 3DS. The arcade's gameplay consisted simply of playing loads of these arcade-style crane-like games in order to acquire these badges, the game's main collectible, and what were basically the selling point of this whole software. Badges were usually themed around other Nintendo properties, and once collected could be used to apply and decorate in the 3DS's home menu. In addition to being decorative, some badges had special functions to them, such as launching applications and were compatible in other software as well. But of course there is a catch for a free-to-play game like this. Given that the player had access to a limited amount of free goes on the machines per day you logged in, and if you wanted any more on a given day, you had to pay around a dollar for five more plays. I actually remember collecting badges in the Nintendo Badge Arcade a lot when I was little on my 3DS, so microtransactions or not, I have fond memories of it and decorating my 3DS menu. At the moment, the game is in a very limited state because of the closure of the 3DS eShop, but in April 2024, the game will completely shut down due to the discontinuation of online play on 3DS and Wii U. So rest in peace, Nintendo Badge Arcade. Pilot Wings. Pilot Wings is a series of games revolving entirely around piloting planes, aircrafts, using hand gliders, jetpacks, and just flying airborne vehicles in general. Being known for its revolutionary at the time 3D gameplay, the series has a strong focus on exploration and just being able to fly freely around open environments, while still having an objective to complete and progression system through earning pilot licenses with lessons in plane flight, hand gliding, skydiving, and the use of a rocket belt. The original Pilot Wings in 1990 for the SNES saw positive reception both public and critical upon its release, and went on to spawn a fully-fledged 3D sequel in 1996's Pilot Wing 64 for the Nintendo 64, which also did very well. The series ultimately saw its third game in 2011 with Pilot Wings Resort for the 3DS, which saw the adoption of the Mii avatars into the series and the setting of the Wii Sports series, but that is the last Pilot Wings has seen in regards to any mainline game releases. 
Street Pass Me Plaza. So for those of us who own 3DSs, we probably remember the system Street Pass functionality. Whether we actually used it or not is a different question, but regardless, Street Pass was the 3DS's way of communicating with and exchanging data with other people's 3DSs when you were close enough to them, within distance of passing them on the street even, hence the name. This info could be used to share interior designs in Animal Crossing, time trial ghosts in Mario Kart, and among other things like that. And Street Pass Me Plaza was this game that came pre-installed to the 3DS, which used the Street Pass functionality along with the Mii avatars. Exchanging data with another user in the game would let you meet and use their Mii characters in the Mii Plaza, and you could use their Mii's along with your own ones to play through two pre-downloaded games that Street Pass Mii Plaza came with. There was Puzzle Swap, which had the player aim to complete a puzzle picture of a Nintendo game by swapping and collecting puzzle pieces with other users. And there was Find Me, which was an RPG game using the Mii's with traditional simple RPG combat gameplay. Across the next five years after its launch, Nintendo produced 11 extra paid DLC games for Street Pass Mii Plaza. For the sake of brevity, I won't explain them all, but the roster of games included cooking simulators, car racing games, puzzle RPG games, fishing simulators, zombie battling games, etc. All of which using the Miis as characters, of course. And the Street Pass Me Plaza series has essentially left off with its last wave of DLC games, which was implemented in September 2016. The Legendary Starfy the Legendary Starfy series is a series of platformer games that are all pretty much set in aquatic or beachside ocean-related sort of marine settings. All the characters following the same motif of being sea creatures or underwater inhabitants of the world. And while it is a platformer, it's one actually focusing more on swimming than traditional running and jumping though. In the games, players control the cutesy star-shaped protagonist of the series, Starfy. And from the third installment onwards, Starfy's sister, Starly, is also occasionally playable. When on land, the controls are conventional and as you would expect from most platformer games. And when in the Water, of course, swimming controls are to be expected, i.e. no jumping, free directional control, etc. The games also follow traditional world and stage formats for the levels, with each stage split up into four substages. Boss fights at the end of each world's final substages, final boss at the end of the game, you get the idea. Most of the other substages' goals are centered around retrieving a lost or stolen item for another character. The stages have power-ups, enemies, collectible items. The series ticks off all the boxes for the cutesy Kirby-esque platformer game, to be honest. The series began in 2002 with Densetsu no Starfy for the Game Boy Advance, and four sequels were released following it, all following the same formula. But for its first seven years, none of the Starfy games were released outside Japan. It wasn't until the fifth and latest game in the series was released, 2009's The Legendary Starfy for the Nintendo DS, that the series would come to other territories. Swap Notes it's very tough to call Swap Note a series, considering it has one installment, which is hardly even a game, but essentially what Swap Note was, was a messaging app for the 3DS that allowed users to send handwritten and drawn messages to either registered friends online via SpotPass or other users locally via StreetPass. The app also allowed users to use pictures and sounds in their messages, and change the position and the orientation of the picture and sound icons, and generally granted a good level of personalization for any message or piece you wanted to put out there. More features could be unlocked as players continue to send letters, such as the ability to hand write and draw 3D messages with additional stationery and features unlocked by spending play coins or via certain Nintendo related events, such as using specific software or by saving them from other people's messages. The series is most known and remembered for its titular mascot and hostess special me character Nikki. By standard, Nikki would give players tutorial messages that appear when users start up and use the app over time, as well as several special notifications sent from Nintendo where Nikki would announce special occasions like Christmas, Valentine's Day, etc. And Nikki even went on to cameo in Smash Bros as an assist trophy. On October 31st, 2013, Nintendo suspended SpotPass functionality of SwapNote, and there hasn't been any SwapNote reiterations for any consoles since, so it's safe to say the series has seen the sun set over a grateful universe. The Mysterious Murasame Castle The Mysterious Murasame Castle is an action-adventure video game developed by Nintendo and Human Entertainment and published by Nintendo for the NES in 1986. In the game, the player takes on the role of the main samurai protagonist, Takamaru, who wields a katana and shuriken. The objective is to race through five castles, obtain the four gems from the castle lords, and defeat the main antagonist, Murasame. The player moves much like early Legend of Zelda, with a top-down perspective with no side-scrolling. The game has only a limited number of power-ups, forcing players to rely on their own action skills more than anything else, using the katana to deflect projectiles and for close quarters combat as well as Takamaru's aforementioned shurikens to throw at the game's cast of enemies. Like samurai, 
Samurais, Ninjas, and Demon Hanya. If you couldn't already tell, the game relies very heavily on traditional Japanese theming and context. While the mysterious Murasame Castle never received a proper sequel, the game as well as Takamaru have made several appearances in other video games, like mini-games in WarioWare, sub-games in Nintendo Land, features in Smash Bros, etc. Nintendogs the Nintendo series is a collective of pet-themed simulation games Nintendo developed and published for the Nintendo DS during 2005. Nintendogs uses the DS's touchscreen and built-in microphone. The games all focus on taking care of and just generally interacting with a pet dog. The game released with multiple versions, each with a different dog breed as the focus. Kind of like choosing which Pokemon game you want based on the legendary on the cover of the game. Players can use the touchscreen to pet their virtual dog, as well as to use various items that can be found or purchased. These range from balls and frisbees to toys to grooming supplies to keep the dogs happy. The microphone is used to call to the player's dog by speaking the name given to the dog in the beginning of the game as well as to teach the dog tricks such as sit or roll over. The game also uses the internal clock to simulate the passage of time, with dogs growing hungrier, dirtier and needier as time passes so you can keep tending to them to keep them happy. Players can bring their dogs on walks into the park as well and can actually interact with nearby players' dogs using street pass. Nintendo Dogs received critical acclaim and won many awards, even netting itself the Innovation Award in 2006 which sounds like it comes with very high prestige. I'm sure Nintendo were proud of themselves after that one. And a sequel titled Nintendogs Plus Cats was released for the Nintendo 3DS in 2011, which also came with multiple versions. And the Nintendogs IP has seen a wealth of references since its last 2011 release. Throughout countless Nintendo games since, assist trophies, smash stages, warriorware games, etc. Advance Wars. The Advance Wars series is a series comprised of four games that all centre around turn-based strategy battle all with a military theme. The game takes place on a fictional continent where two nations, Orange Star and Blue Moon, have been fighting each other for years. The conflict enters a new stage when an Orange Star commanding officer named Andy is accused of attacking the armies of two other nations, Yellow Comet and Green Earth without reason, resulting in a worldwide war. So you get the gist, multiple factions warring with each other and you control some of the forces at play in the battle. The battles of Advance Wars are turn Based. Two to four armies, each headed by a commanding officer, take turns building and commanding units on grid based maps, while attacking enemy units, moving positions, holding ground, or capturing enemy and neutral properties to determine the fate of the war. The series technically had a history predating the Advance Wars titles, with six games from 1988 to 2001 on several older consoles like Famicom Wars and Game Boy Wars. But it wasn't until 2001 that the series would adopt the Advance Wars name on the Game Boy Advance. So Advance Wars as a series is actually more of a sub-series of the larger Wars series as a whole than its own individual series. The most recent thing Nintendo has done for the series was a reboot of Advance Wars 1 and 2 for the Nintendo Switch. Wild Gunman. Wild Gunman is another light gun shooter game Nintendo developed and published for arcade systems. This one actually originally all the way back in 1974. The game was later adapted to traditional video game format in 1984 and eventually released in 1985 as a launch game for the NES with the Zapper light gun accessory, the same one that was used for Duck Hunt. The gameplay of Wild Gunman consists of what is essentially the playable version of the classic old Wild Western standoff trope you can expect from movies of the genre, just translated to video game format. The player has to stare down one of many enemy cowboy characters, and when a sudden visual and audio prompt is given, i.e. the enemy gunman exclaiming, fire, the player has to react in time to shoot before getting shot. Very simple reaction time based minigame from what I've gathered. Regardless of whether the player succeeded in taking down the enemy gunslinger, they will still continue to face off against other gunslinger opponents, of which there are five in total. The original Wild Gunman 74 arcade game actually used live action footage Nintendo recorded in an amusement park around Kyoto, whereas the NES version of course used traditional sprite work for the gunslingers. The series has not returned since its first and last console release in 1984. Big Brain Academy. Big Brain Academy is a series of puzzle video games Nintendo has developed and published from 2005 to 2021. Similar to the Brain Age series, each game features a number of activities and mini games designed to test, measure, and improve the player's mental skills. In format, it is incredibly similar to the Brain Age series, with the largest difference being that this series aesthetically is a lot more cutesy and vibrant and uses characters that look a lot more like bootleg kids show extras than the absolute red pilled Sigma that was Dr. Kawashima. The games also feature a test and practice mode like Brain Age did, with each of the three installments developing on the format with the most recent entry in 2021's Big Brain Academy Brain vs Brain for the Nintendo Switch, even introducing party game elements like multiplayer, comparing results and even costumes and stuff. 
Big Brain Academy for Smash, don't at me. Ever Oasis. Ever Oasis is an action-adventure RPG game developed by Grezzo and published by Nintendo for the Nintendo 3DS. It was revealed at E3 2016 and released the following year in 2017. The game does seem to follow traditional RPG game format. There's the grand overworld for you to explore, the story following the small underdog hero needing to surmount terrifying adversity, and battles aren't turn-based but focus on real-time action. In the game, players try to build a prosperous oasis in this desert by completing missions in dungeons and caves in the desert. Players can form a party of up to three characters and battle enemies that are possessed by chaos in real-time combat encounters, with the ability to switch between three party members. Players can forage for materials in caves and puzzle-filled dungeons throughout the game, with the plot telling the story of Tethu slash Tethi, a young seedling who, with the help of a water spirit named Esna, creates an oasis after their brother Nawa gets kidnapped and the oasis falls to chaos. The player then traverses the world of Ever Oasis, recruiting new characters from different villages and civilizations across the world, defeating chaos-controlled creatures and uncovering what happened to their brother. The game released a majority positive reviews, and to be honest, the game does look like a fun, possibly underrated 3DS title. But the game hasn't seen a sequel or even a port since its 2017 debut, so the Ever Oasis series remains just a single game. Nintendo Labo. So this probably rang a lot of bells for those watching, considering how recently the Nintendo Labo idea was being marketed by Nintendo towards the beginning of the Switch's lifespan. Nintendo Labo was this sort of half toys to life, half DIY concept and Nintendo developed and released in April 2018 for the Nintendo Switch. Labo consists of two parts, where one part is the actual Nintendo Labo video game and the other part is multiple sheets of cardboard and parts you could buy. The games come as physical kits that include cardboard cutouts and other materials that are to be assembled in combination with the Nintendo Switch console and Joy-Con controllers to create a Toy-Con that can interact with the included game software and vice versa. For example, a constructible cardboard fishing rod where the Joy-Con can sit in the reel and the handle of the rod to send motion input from the Joy-Con to the Switch to play a fishing game. Same thing goes for a cardboard piano, steering wheel, etc. The game was praised for its creativity and ingenuity and accessibility to young and old audiences alike and is probably something only Nintendo could really have pulled off. However, despite its financial and commercial success, there hasn't really been anything going on with Nintendo Labo since its debut in 2018. Box Boy. Box Boy is a series of puzzle platform games developed by HAL Laboratory and published by Nintendo. The series centers around QB, a box-shaped boy character who can produce a chain of connected boxes to use as leverage to overcome the game's platforming challenges, as platforms themselves to overcome obstacles or any other way the player can use them to figure out how to clear a stage. It is a puzzle series after all. The boxes are used to overcome obstacles in platforming stages that QB must traverse through. The games also adopt the traditional worlds and stages format you can expect from those platformers. And completing stages rewards the player with medals that can be spent on challenge stages, music, and costumes for QB. The original Box Boy was actually just a small experimental project in development while HAL Laboratories was working on Kirby Triple Deluxe and Kirby and the Rainbow Curse. But it went on to see a sequel the following year with 2016's Box Box Boy for the 3DS, with the most recent fourth installment, Box Boy Plus Box Girl, having been released worldwide for the Nintendo Switch via download from the Nintendo eShop in 2019, which contains a preposterous 270 levels across three campaigns, each game naturally adapting on the Box Boy format, even going on to introduce Box Girl as a new character in the Ultimate release. The series also had an amiibo made for it, which I've always wanted but never gotten. It just looks perfect. I want the Box Boy amiibo. Someone please send it to me. Astral Chain. Astral Chain is a 2019 action adventure hack and slash video game developed by Platinum Games and published by Nintendo for the Nintendo Switch. As is standard for a Platinum Games release, it's well made, flashy, and has a story I can't really condense into the time span of an iceberg entry explanation, considering I haven't even played Astral Chain yet. But here's a brief plot summation. Set in a dystopian future Earth, the game follows the events of a special police task force that protect remnants of humanity from interdimensional creatures and aberrations that invade the planet, with the story centering on two new recruits that have entered the task force. Utilizing the titular Astral Chain, which from what I've gathered is this chain or connection that tethers the protagonist to these familiar beings called legions, which they can summon for battle and puzzle solving. I guess similar to Personas from Persona or Stands from Jojo's, loosely of course. The twins restrain and tether the creatures, employing them in combat and investigation. The setting of the game draws heavy inspiration from various cyberpunk manga and anime, while the gameplay combines hack and slash combat with role playing elements and investigative adventure game sections. The gameplay segments revolve heavily around the simultaneous controlling of two characters, the player character Twin and their Legion. The game released to generally positive reviews critically and sold over 1.3 million units, so considering its success, 
I find it hard to believe we won't see a sequel to Astral Chain somewhere in the future. AR Games AR Games was a series of these mini-games that came pre-installed onto the 3DS system. The games all make use of the augmented reality functionality of the 3DS. It came with six of these little paper cards that all had a picture of a Nintendo character on them. One with Mario, one with Link, with Kirby, Pikmin and Samus, and the sixth card had a question mark block on it. By scanning any of the cards with Nintendo characters on them with the 3DS, you could make a 3D model of the character appear on top of the camera. You could resize the model, move it around, pose it differently. This part of AR games wasn't so much a game as it was what felt like just a showcase of a niche capability the system had. But by scanning the question mark block card, you could cause this little guy to show up. I guess they're the series mascot of sorts, this little box creature with his little legs and eyes. You could shoot at him and the many boxes he spawned to play one of five mini games. them all being about things like fishing or archery. So he basically acted as both the mascot and the menu. Each of the mini games actually end in a boss fight against one of these dragons, which is pretty neat. I just find it interesting how whole little boss encounters were made for such an obscure part of the 3DS that most people who had the console probably never even experienced. AR Games has not returned since its debut along with the release of the 3DS in 2011. Color TV Game The Color TV Game was actually the first video game console system Nintendo ever created. It predates the NES and even the Game & Watch in Nintendo's history of console video game devices. The system was released as a series of five dedicated home video game consoles between 1977 and 1980 in Japan only. The color game systems came with controllers wired to the console. Each system came with essentially one game, with other sub-modes. For example, the Color TV Game 6 and Color TV Game 15 systems, which came with two controllers each with simple turnable dials, which both were basically Pong clones. Gameplay was basically just Pong, with several playable modes that would adapt on the format, like having obstacles in the middle of the screen, extra paddles, and other modifications. Other Color TV Game systems came with steering wheels and stuff, of course each system designed for its own unique game. The success the success of the Color TV game series is what gave Nintendo faith in the console business, leading to the ultimate creation of the Nintendo Entertainment System on July 15th, 1983. Kuru Kuru Kururin the Kururin series is comprised of three games, beginning with 2001's Kuru Kuru Kururin for the Game Boy Advance. It's a puzzle game by definition, but I'm not too sure what I would really classify it as. The gameplay has you controlling and playing as this slowly rotating spinning stick, called the Hellerin, or the helicopter in the European localization, while you must maneuver it through a series of mazes without touching the walls. You can speed up or slow down its movement depending on how many buttons you hold down, with three levels of speed total. It's weird to describe, but when you actually watch gameplay, it starts to look kind of fun. Not anything revolutionary or grand, but at the same time it's probably enjoyable to burn 20 or 30 minutes or so working through some stages in the game. The story follows Kururin, who is this little bird, at least I think it's a bird, it looks like he has a beak, as he pilots the Hellerin through the game's worlds in order to rescue his brothers and sisters who have gone missing. The first sequel to the game was released in 2002 for the Game Boy Advance with Kururin Paradise, and the third in 2004 with the GameCube's Kururin Squash, which brought 3D graphics to the series. Both of the sequels, unlike the first installment, oddly were never released outside of Japan. Japan. Clue Clue Land Clue Clue Land is a puzzle video game Nintendo developed and published in 1984 for the Famicom and NES. In Clue Clue Land, the player is a female balloon fish named Bubbles, known as Gloopy in Japan, who swims around in a maze trying to uncover all the golden ingots. By the looks of it, the gameplay basically just involves you swimming around the maze using all these poles, which are the little dots across the maze, as points to swing around and change direction with. And while passing between the poles, you can uncover the aforementioned gold ingots. There are these enemies called Unira, which are the antagonists of the series and canonically are these evil sea urchins which have stolen all of the treasures of the underwater kingdom Clue Clue Land centers around. The objective of the game is to uncover all the gold ingots in each stage while avoiding the Onira and black holes. As the game progresses, it adapts minorly on that format, but that's pretty much a summary of the whole game. Since its 1984 release, Clue Clue Land hasn't seen any direct sequel or new installments, but has seen its fair share of ports and references across following consoles and games. Jam with the Band Jam with the Band, otherwise known in Japan as Daigasso Band Brothers DX, is a music game Nintendo developed and published for the Nintendo DS in 2008. It is the sequel to the Japan exclusive Daigasso Band Brothers, which was released in 2004 also for the DS. Both of the games, which make up what should probably be called the Daigasso Band Brothers series, are, as I said, music games. Their gameplay can basically be summarized to press the right buttons at the right times to make the right sounds at the right times to make the right music. Of course, that is somewhat of a simplification 
notification. It isn't just press button, make sound. You have to interact in real time and execute more complex commands like different button combinations or touchscreen interactions to raise notes by octaves or semitones, for example, in some of the game's more difficult challenges. But overall, the games are all about keeping in time and being coordinated, and making the right commands to keep up with a piece of music. Digasso Band Brothers actually utilizes the Nintendo DS's wireless link connection to allow multiple players to join in and make music together. In two to eight player link ups, each player, like in solo player mode, takes command of one specific instrument in the music piece. Each player in the group is part of a band, and must play the song together as a group, and the better each player follows along, the more in tune the song comes through, and Jam with the Band features over 60 instruments to play with. How preposterous. The songs in the game are all a mix of classical songs, video game themes, licensed themes from TV shows and movies, etc. This series hasn't had any attention since its last European release in 2010. 1080 Avalanche is a snowboarding video game for the GameCube released in 2003, developed by Nintendo's in-house development studio Nintendo Software Technology and published of course by Nintendo. The gameplay of 1080 Avalanche focuses on racing downhill across snow-capped mountain trails, trying to either outrace another snowboarder or outpace an oncoming avalanche. In over 20 of the game's courses, the player can compete in the main match mode, along with trick attack, time trials and gate mode. There are multiple playable riders, each with their own boards and characteristics. And this game actually looks like a good bit of high-paced frantic racing fun. And what's funny about it is that it is the sequel to an earlier Nintendo 64 game, 1080 Snowboarding, which released five years prior in 1998. In this game, the player controls one of five snowboarders from a third-person perspective, using a combination of buttons to jump and perform tricks over eight levels. It's basically the same game, bar of course lesser graphical quality and less game content overall. The iceberg image I'm using for this video used the 1080 Avalanche logo as the series logo, but given this series is actually a two-game series, both with the title 1080, it's probably more appropriate to call this series the 1080 series, or the 1080 degree series. One of those doesn't roll off the tongue quite as well. Sheriff one of many Western-themed arcade games from the 70s, Nintendo Sheriff is this multi-directional 2D shooter game they made for arcade cabinets in 1979. In Sheriff, the player controls Mr. Jack, a sheriff, against a gang of attacking bandits to defend the town and rescue Betty, the captured woman. It's worth noting this was actually Nintendo's first foray into the damsel in distress plotline, predating even the original Donkey Kong. Sheriff distinctly features two separate controls, a joystick for movement and a dial control for aiming and firing. A configuration unusual for arcade games and non-existent in consoles at the time. The joystick moves the character and the dial aims and fires your gun, each in eight separate directions, allowing Mr. Jack to walk in one direction while shooting in another. Mind-blowingly advanced for the time, I can imagine. There's a fence lining the perimeter of the area Mr. Jack is in, which can be broken down by bullet fire, and is what separates you from the 16 enemy bandits who are also shooting at you. Defeat all the bandits to win, get defeated by the bandits to lose, you get the idea. Sheriff never really returned after its debut, save for a re-release as part of a WarriorWare game in 2003. Sports Series. The Sports Series was one of the many different series Nintendo published comprised of various NES games in America. Here are some of the other series with their respective logos, like the Robot Series, Education Series, and Light Gun Series. Games that were part of the series were marked as so on the bottom left-hand corner of the box art with the Sports Series logo. Many different games were released in the series, although not every sports game made by Nintendo at the time was marked as part of the series because eventually Nintendo scrapped the idea. The Sports Series ran from 1983 to 1988, with the following titles, none of which really having any correlation to each other or canon connections other than being under the umbrella of the sport series name. Baseball, tennis, golf, 10-yard fight, soccer, pro wrestling, volleyball, rad racer, slalom, ice hockey, and world-class track meets. I'm not going to explain each game, I mean from their titles I think it's pretty clear what gameplay to expect. They all released during the early to late 80s, so I wouldn't expect anything too revolutionary. But yeah, in baseball you play baseball, in soccer you play football, and in pro wrestling you wrestle. You get the idea. That is the NES Sports Series. Ring Fit Adventure. Another relatively recent gimmicky one-off Switch title here that you probably remember. Ring Fit Adventure was an action-adventure RPG game that felt much in the same vein as the Wii Sports titles and generally held the same sort of interactive get up and move around in your living room vibe that those earlier games did, just with the Switch theming. The game came with two attachments to use in conjunction with the Joy-Cons, a plastic ring and a leg strap, 
both of which made to have the Joy-Con slotted into them. The game's main mode, the Adventure mode, has the player complete turn-based RPG gameplay, where the player's actions and battle moves are based on performing certain physical activities using the ring con and leg strap, with the motion controls within the Joy-Con making this possible. In addition to the Adventure mode, the game includes a general fitness routine mode that allows one to perform the exercises assisted by the game but without the traditional game elements. The game also has several mini-games based on certain exercises, which can be played by a single player to challenge themselves or can be used with multiple players each taking a turn to beat the others. The game released in October 2019 to great reviews and pretty impressive sales, and in terms of content it received one rhythm based game mode in 2020, but that's about all Ring Fit Adventure as a series has seen since its debut. Also the antagonist of the adventure mode is this huge bodybuilding dragon called Drago, who if you ask me absolutely should have been added to Smash Ultimate as a super heavyweight fighter. And let's just be real here, this guy would fuck up Bowser, Ganon, Ridley, DDD, King K. Rool, anyone he wants. Every other series antagonist gets shot on. Everyone's getting murked and put in the fucking grave by this absolute weapon. Drago, absolute goat of Nintendo villains. Steel Diver Sub Wars. So during E3 2004, a game called Steel Diver was first shown as a playable tech demo for the then upcoming Nintendo DS, which was just a somewhat early in development experimental piece of gaming during the production of a submarine based game that was being developed by legendary developer and father of Super Mario, Shigeru Miyamoto. Even though the tech demo at E3 2004 met good reception, Miyamoto was unable to expand on the idea until late into the DS's lifespan due to scheduling conflicts within Nintendo. When the team was finally able to be allocated to the project, the specifications of the then unannounced 3DS console became known to him, at which point he felt the game would work better as a 3DS title. And then, lo and behold, six years after the DS demo, Nintendo revealed the game Steel Diver at E3 2010 as a launch title for the Nintendo 3DS. Steel Diver consists of three main game modes, Missions, Periscope Strike, and Steel Command. Missions is further broken down into two modes, Campaign and Time Trials. The main gameplay occurs during Campaign, where the player uses the bottom screen of the 3DS as a control panel to control and maneuver a submarine throughout several underwater missions. Other modes using differing controls like Periscope Strike, which has the player use gyro controls to look out from a periscope on the top screen. In June 2013, it was announced that Nintendo was working on their first free-to-play game, which would be based on Steel Diver to be released by 2014. This was ultimately revealed to be titled Steel Diver Sub Wars, which was released in February 2014. This time the series adopting a first-person perspective as the player pilots a submarine in underwater combat. Even with online multiplayer being added and functional while the 3DS still had its online capabilities. But since 2014, Steel Diver hasn't seen another installment with Sub Wars being its final game. Custom Robo. Custom Robo is an action RPG game series developed by game studio Noise and published by Nintendo. The series has spanned five games and has titles on consoles from the Nintendo 64 to the Nintendo DS, with only the two most recent titles having seen a release outside of Japan. Beginning in 1999, the Custom Robo series consists of both RPG story elements with an overworld and narrative to progress through, along with the series trademark 3D frantic multiplayer arena fighting battles, where you control a Robo, which is just a robot robot fighter, which you can mix and match and customise what gear, equipment, guns, bombs and other factors the robot has to affect how it plays and fights. The objective of these battles is to reduce your enemy robo's health from 100 to 0 to win the battle and continue with the game. In each game's story mode, players slip into the role of a nameable protagonist just beginning to learn about custom robo. In each game, the first robo players obtain is always the latest model of the Ray series. The goal for players is to improve their skills and collect different custom robo body kits and gear in order to defeat everyone, including champions custom robo users. So I guess it's like robot Pokemon, but not Digimon. N no, not Digimon. The most recent custom robo release was Custom Robo Arena in 2006 for the Nintendo DS. Drill Dozer. Developed by Game Freak, published by Nintendo, and released in 2005 for the Game Boy Advance, Drill Dozer is this kind of niche action platformer game that, to be honest, could probably hold its own against bigger titles like Kirby or New Super Mario Bros. if it was just given more love by Nintendo. The series has just one game, the eponymous Drill Dozer, which, as the title implies, holds its whole gimmick and premise in this little drill equipped robot thing, the Drill Dozer. Wait a minute, what, what the fuck? The Drill Dozer just took the red pill. Wait, wait. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
In the game, you play as the protagonist, Jill, who I thought was a rabbit, but I think she's supposed to be something else, so I'm not sure. Who, of course, pilots the drill dozer, which you can attack enemies with, drill through parts of the stage with, traverse platforming challenges with, etc. All 17 of the game's massive stages are flooded with enemies, obstacles, and puzzles, which force Jill to use drill dozer's drill in a wide variety of ways. The drill is activated by simply pushing one of the shoulder buttons. The R button spins the drill forward, and the L button spins it backwards. You can run, jump, everything. It's a platform a game, you get the idea. The game received positive reviews on release and is now often considered one of the best Game Boy Advance games of all time. But despite its surprisingly overwhelming praise upon release, Game Freak, for whatever reason, hasn't brought it back since the GBA. Who knows why? Maybe someday in the future. Puzzle League. The Puzzle League games are a series of like half spin-off, half collab, I'm using that term very loosely, games that Nintendo has published across several consoles and for various of their IPs from 1995 to 2006 most recently. The series began with just simply Puzzle League for the SNES and Game Boy, which was basically just the unbranded game of the series. And since then there's been Animal Crossing Puzzle League, Dr. Mario Puzzle League, Nintendo Puzzle League, and the most well known of them, Pokemon Puzzle League. In each game in the series, colourful square blocks are stacked stacked in a well. The blocks align to an invisible grid and stack in rows and columns. In most game modes, new blocks appear at the bottom of the stack, slowly pushing the stack upward. The player typically loses the game when any column of blocks touches the top of the well. To clear away blocks and stay in the game, the players must align them in rows or columns of three or more identically coloured blocks. So you get the idea. It's sort of like Tetris, but not really. It's Nintendo's own brand Tetris, to be honest. And they've used lots of their popular IPs and brands with the idea to create a handful of Puzzle League games. It's something I can definitely see returning and being announced forgettably at the start of a Nintendo Direct for another IP like Kirby or something in the future. Sin and Punishment Sin and Punishment is a series Nintendo co-developed with Treasure and published themselves for two of their consoles. It's a series of on-rails shooter games, basically looking like a glorified modern arcade game to be honest, that debuted on the Nintendo 64 with the first Sin and Punishment in the year 2000. The story of Sin and Punishment takes place in the at the time near future of 2007, when war breaks out as humanity is struggling with a global famine. The player takes on the roles of protagonists Saki and Eren as they fight to save Earth from destruction. The game employs a unique control scheme that uses both the D-pad and control stick on the Nintendo 64 controller, allowing players to maneuver the character while simultaneously aiming the targeting reticle. The player must shoot at enemies and projectiles while also dodging attacks to survive and progress through the game and its very strongly dystopian apocalyptic aesthetic and world. Sin and Punishment went on to see a sequel in 2009 for the Wii with Sin and Punishment Star Successor, and it does just seem to be basically a more graphically advanced version of the first game, of course this time with shooter controls using the Wiimote and Nunchuck. This was was the last installment of the series, and to be honest I've never played either Sin and Punishment game, but just from watching gameplay of Star Successor, the enemy designs and world of the game actually interest me quite a lot. Feels very Sega-esque to me for some reason. I kinda wanna play the games now, because if the gameplay is enjoyable, this is probably a pretty solid game series. Captain Rainbow. A game that never made it out of Japan, and a game that is very niche. I'll use the word niche to describe it. Captain Rainbow is an action-adventure video game developed by Skip Limited, published by Nintendo for the Wii, and released exclusively in Japan on August 28, 2008. The game's storyline follows protagonist Nick, who is able to transform into his Sigma alter ego, Captain Rainbow. A yo-yo wielding superhero that stars in his own TV show, but one that is no longer popular. The narrative focusing on his attempts to restore his popularity. Nick ventures to Mimin Island, an island where wishes are said to come true, where he meets multiple other B-list Nintendo characters of past with their own dreams and wishes across his journey. Captain Rainbow is an action-adventure game, with gameplay divided into two parts. The adventure part of the game, where you can enjoy the island life and play multiple mini-games like fishing, boxing, golf, etc. Every time you help a fellow islander, you are granted crystals. If you collect 20 of them, you can play the action part of the game, where you must carry a magical star while being antagonized by this evil shadow to the top of an altar to grant a wish. So yeah, it's sad that as creative and fresh as the Captain Rainbow concept seems, it was a total flop. The game received some abysmal sales, under 7,000 copies sold first week and under 23,000 copies sold in 2008 in total. So I don't think it's that confusing as to why it never got a sequel, let alone a localization. 
codename Steam. The 3DS's codename Steam, or as it is known in Japan, Lincoln vs. Aliens, is a third-person turn-based strategy game. The gameplay involves a team of characters controlled by the player known as the Agents of Steam, facing off against an opposing team of alien invaders. For the player, both movement and attacking requires the use of Steam, a resource that depletes whenever a character moves around or uses their weapon, in the latter case depending on the type of weapon being used. The game's main campaign is divided into chapters, which are subdivided into levels, with mission objectives such as reaching the goal, saving a number of civilians, escorting a character to safety, etc. And the game even had online multiplayer and local modes with deathmatches, medal battles, and even 1v1 mech battles, which does sound fun to be fair. The game aesthetically is pretty cool, with the whole story adapting this sort of comic book framing visually. The game released to mixed and average scores, so I guess in actuality it was kind of mid. But it looked cool, it looked alright, I'll be honest. The game hasn't seen a sequel or anything at all from Nintendo really since its 2015 release. Disaster Day of Crisis, a series comprised of just one 2008 game of the same name. Disaster Day of Crisis is a action-adventure light gun shooter that Nintendo published for the Wii, developed by Monolith Soft. It's another game that takes on the same on-rails arcade-style shooter format, being played from a third-person perspective, but not entirely. There is a lot of freely moving 3D navigation gameplay, quick-time events, and mini-games. For example, the player can perform actions such as pressing buttons in rhythm to perform CPR, moving heavy objects and running from floodwaters and lava flows by quickly moving the Wii Remote and Nunchuck and driving a car by holding the Wii Remote on its side and tilting it left or right, which aren't all necessarily on rails, but the game still has that cinematic, predetermined direction that most arcade styles do. Disaster's core combat is primarily played out as a rail shooter that uses the Wii Remote's pointer function to target enemies with one of many guns and weapons you can have equipped. The game's campaign, following protagonist Raymond Bryce, as he must survive various natural disasters while also battling terrorists and rescuing civilians, covers 23 stages which which can all be replayed for a higher score. The game also includes a shooting range, stamina challenges, unlockable weapons and costumes, and a more difficult real disaster mode. The game released to what was a generally mixed reception, and since its 2008 debut, Disaster Day of Crisis hasn't seen any succeeding games. Fossil Fighters. Fossil Fighters is a series with three games Nintendo published from 2008 to 2014 for the DS and 3DS consoles. Each game revolves around discovering, digging up, cleaning, and extracting dinosaur fossils, which you then revive back into their original dinosaur form, which becomes a vivisaur. The series centering around sending your vivisaurs into battle with other vivisaurs. So essentially, imagine Pokemon, but just with dinosaurs. And instead of catching them with Pokeballs, you dig them up as fossils, I think. The first game, Fossil Fighters for the Nintendo DS, follows the hero protagonist, a nameable young boy, as he comes to Vivasaur Island. He becomes a fossil fighter and rises up the fighter ranks with his Vivasaurs, eventually becoming a master fighter. So you kind of get the idea. Collect and battle with the dinosaurs and rise up to be the best fighter. Each game following adapted on the format logically, adding game elements here and there but nothing revolutionary. Up to the most recent 3DS release with 2014's Fossil Fighters Frontier. Doshin the Giant. Developed by game studio Param and published by Nintendo, Doshin the Giant is this god simulation game that was released for the N64 and GameCube in 1999. Naturally, as it is of course a god game, Doshin the Giant's gameplay revolves around carrying out your godlike ability and tasks across a smaller island called Barudo, such as altering its geography, managing natural disasters, or answering the prayers from simulated worshippers. Its designer, Kazutoshi Lida, has described it as Populous meets Mario. As you can tell from the cheery aesthetic, it's not too serious of a god game. The player controls the god Doshin as he tries to help or hinder the island's inhabitants. Doing so causes the villagers to release love or hate, which Doshin absorbs. The two feelings cancel each other out, but if he gets enough of one type, he will grow inside. Doshin is the love giant, a yellow cheese string-esque giant with a happy face and a few strands of hair. He is a benevolent being whose helpful actions earn love from his people and cause his body to increase in size for a day and return to normal size the next. He can pick up objects such as people and trees. Doshin can transform at will into his evil alter ego Jashin, the hate giant. The game actually went on to receive an expansion disc, so basically physical DLC, following a pretty different narrative where Doshin is imprisoned in a kid's dream world that was released in the year 2000 and was the last addition to the Doshin the Giant series. Also, the game got shit on by critics, absolutely shit on, 2.5 out of 10 apparently, with an IGN reviewer ending his review of the game with one word painful. So yeah, Doshin the Giant, not very Pogchamp apparently. But even if the game wasn't that good, 
I kind of like it. I think its aesthetic is really appealingly dream-esque. It reminds me slightly of LSD Dream, em 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 yep. LSD Dream Emulator, even if the game isn't quite as psychedelic as that one. And especially the expansion, I think is just super abstract and cool and interesting. So I do respect Dosh and the Giant, even if the gameplay was shit. Eternal Darkness. Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem is an action-adventure video game developed by Silicon Knights and published by Nintendo for the GameCube in 2002. The game follows the story of several characters across a very broad time period of two millennia and four different locations across Earth, as they contend with an ancient evil who seeks to enslave humanity. The gameplay distinguishes itself with unique sanity effects, visual and audio effects that confuse the player and often break the fourth wall. The game is played from a third-person perspective. You navigate through the game world, have an inventory which you can store items and weapons with, combat is fairly simple, you just lock not your target and, well, combat them. You solve puzzles, cast spells with magic, and try to keep your sanity meter from depleting. As the bar becomes low, subtle changes to the environment and random unusual events begin to occur, which reflects the character's dwindling grip on reality. Yes, very inventive stuff here in Eternal Darkness. The game released to very positive critical acclaim, receiving awards and nominations post-release, and it looked certain it would receive a sequel, but while one was planned and teased constantly from 2006 to 2011, it was eventually cancelled due to legal troubles with Epic Games and with the demolition of Silicon Knights as a game studio in 2013, there probably won't be a real successor to Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem anytime soon. Cubivore. Cubivore Survival of the Fittest, or Cubivore for short, is a game focused around playing as this cube-shaped carnivore, a pig initially. You start off as a cube pig, and throughout the game you fight off against other cubivore creatures in fast-paced simple but strategic combat encounters, where you must weaken, kill, and tear off the limbs of opposing cubivores. Nasty. You then eat the cubivore you killed, where you take on some of its characteristics and develop your cubivore and make it stronger. Once you get strong enough, you can mate and reproduce to create offspring, kind of like a rebirth system I suppose, where you rinse and repeat the cycle, reproduce 100 times, and you should finally have evolved enough to defeat the overarching antagonist end goal of the game. Game, the tyrant's villain, the killer cubivore, and restore nature since the killer cubivore has pretty much destroyed it. It is odd, to be honest. It's one of the more abstract takes on teaching the idea of evolution and the survival of the fittest, but hey, pretty interesting. Cubivore Survival of the Fittest, released for the GameCube in 2002, to above average critical review, but saw no sequels. NES Remix NES Remix is a series of remastered compilation games Nintendo has produced since 2013 for the Wii U and the 3DS. Each one takes a whole wide variety of NES games and basically just compiles them into one collection. The first game, NES Remix, contains 16 vintage remixed NES games ported to the newer Nintendo hardware. Each game was given several little challenges and sort of mini-games over the original gameplays to play through, like collecting a certain amount of 1-ups in the original Super Mario Bros, jumping over a certain amount of barrels in Donkey Kong, etc. And this is basically the premise for the gameplay of the NES Remix games. You aren't just replaying old NES titles, but playing little challenges made inside of them. A second game, NES Remix 2, was released in 2014. And another one, Ultimate NES Remix, was released the following year in 2015. With an extra 12 games and another 169 challenges added, on top of the original 16 games and 204 playable challenges from the first NES Remix. And well, you get the idea. Compilations of old NES games, fun unique challenges added to spice them up, a little homage title to the older generations. Pretty neat. Mac Rider. Set in the year 2112, where a dystopian Earth has been invaded by evil vehicle driving forces known as Quad Runners, Mac Rider focuses on the protagonist, Mac Rider, an unnamed vigilante hero who races across the world on his super powered motorbike, rescuing survivors and killing enemies. I honestly didn't realize how badass Mac Rider was before researching it for this iceberg. Gameplay basically just consists of the player driving down the roads of this apocalyptic Earth at high speeds, avoiding obstacles and shooting at any enemies ahead of you. The game's controls are somewhat more complex than other games at its time and require some extra skills. The left and right directions on the control pad steer Mac Rider and the A button accelerates. The B button fires Mac Rider's machine gun which can be used to destroy enemies and obstacles on the road and the up and down buttons are used to shift gears. With the game's stages having different objectives like taking down a certain number of enemies, traveling a certain distance and staying alive etc. In 1972, Nintendo originally released a plastic race car slash hot rod toy called Mac Rider, which predated the game which was first released in in 1995 for the NES, with no sequels. 
Elite Beat Agents. Another one of Nintendo's rhythm games that uses a wacky aesthetic and atmosphere to admittedly remarkable effect in my opinion. Elite Beat Agents is, well, just that, it's a rhythm game. The game focuses around its main characters, these well-trained spy members of a fictional government agency responsible for helping those in need. When a person facing a crisis reaches their breaking point and cries out for help, the commander of the agency dispatches the agents to help them out and save the day. After the introduction to a character and their problem, the agents are deployed and the action begins. The gameplay mechanics involve performing one of three actions with the stylus in various combinations. Tapping the screen with it, tapping and holding with it, and get this, spinning the stylus around on the screen. All of course to the rhythm of a song that is being played, which are all actual popular songs. I'll play an example here with Earth, Wind and Fire September, and I'm praying I don't get copyright strike for this. If it does get strike, the following section will be mute, which won't have quite the effect I'm going for here. If that clip was not a work of video gaming art, I do not know what is. Each stage is divided into multiple gameplay sections separated by story sequences, which all play out with this comic book visual style and the game also has multiplayer. The game is the spiritual successor to another rhythm game Nintendo released for the DS before in Japan called Osu Tatakai Owenden in 2015, which features largely the same gameplay and mechanics but different theming, story and characters, with Elite Beat Agents being created to be geared more towards a western audience. Elite Beat Agents was released to great critical acclaim, but sales-wise was a flop. One month after the game's first release in North America, fils -Aimé himself, disappointed with initial sales, expressed hope that Agents could get a sequel and become a franchise, but ultimately nothing came of it. Ten years later, Yano stated in an interview that he would love to bring a sequel to Elite Beat Agents to a Nintendo platform, but the exact circumstances will depend on the capabilities of those platforms and how well the game fits to it. The Elite Beat Agent series ended with its first release of the same title for the DS in 2006. Pandora's Tower Released around 2012 for the Nintendo Wii, towards the end of its lifespan really, Nintendo's Pandora's Tower is a third-person 3D action-adventure RPG game that has the player explore 13 towers, all bound by chains that are suspended above a giant chasm called the Scar that has been infested with monsters. The player takes the role of protagonist Aeron as he works to rid his love interest Alina of a curse that is slowly turning her into a monstrous beast. While Aeron is within the towers, a time counter is displayed, showing the advancement of Alina's curse. As Aeron defeats both normal enemies and the mass of each tower, he gathers flesh from them, which he must give to Alina to eat and reverse the curse's effects, resetting the timer. Combat, puzzle solving, and adventuring gameplay ensues, all while using a key part of the gameplay, the Oroclos Chain, a weapon that aids in both combat and navigation and lets you traverse the world in unique ways and vanquish the monster foes of the game, giving the combat an articulate edge that can't really be found anywhere else. The environments of the world are interesting and the game has a great soundtrack. The game released to generally pretty positive reviews and respectable financial success, and has remained a title regarded as as one of the last hurrahs of the Wii's lifespan ever since its 2012 release. The Last Story One very, very cinematic and traditional big sweeping JRPG title Nintendo published in 2011. The Last Story is a third-person action role-playing game that was developed by Mist Walker and AQ Interactive for the Wii. The game was directed and co-written by Hironobu Sakaguchi, the original creator of Final Fantasy, which I think explains how traditionally JRPG it feels, with it following the band of unlikely mercenary heroes as they set off on an unexpected quest to save the world from evil forces, I think. There's a magical princess, an ancient prophecy, swords, RPG combat, it's ticking off all the boxes. With a story told across several cinematic chapters and combat featuring you commanding the protagonist Zale and a party of your AI controlled comrades as you fight off against the evil forces, beasts and monsters of the last story's world. Upon release the game actually sold really well, beating out Xenoblade Chronicles even in terms of figures, and critically it did well, averaging around 80% across reviews. But I guess considering there was never a follow up game to the last story, the series, if you can even call it that, has been forgotten by Nintendo and has stayed largely in 2012. 
Sushi Striker, Way of the Sushido. Sushi Striker, The Way of Sushido is an action puzzle video game developed by Indie Zero and published by Nintendo for the 3DS and Switch in June 2018. The game takes place in a world where sushi has been made forbidden by its ruling empire. The protagonist, Musashi, attempts to revert this ban on sushi. The game consists of one-on-one -on -one battles with CPU-controlled opponents, where the player must match sushi plates of the same colour on a series of conveyor belts to cause damage to the opponent. In battle, both the player and the opponent face each other, with constantly moving conveyor belts of sushi between them. The player must match as many sushi plates of the same colour as possible in order to gather them. Musashi will eat the sushi off the plates and the plates will attack the opponent, causing their health to decrease. So put simply, it's a game of sushi 1v1s. Of course the game can be played against CPU or with multiplayer. It doesn't look like the game did astoundingly well sales wise, but it doesn't look too expensive to be honest, so I can't imagine it was a big flop. But it remains another relatively niche obscure indie game across Nintendo's wide catalogue of titles. Stunt Race FX Released originally for the SNES in 1994, Stunt Race FX is a cartoonish, colourful and goofy 3D kart racer that Nintendo published and developed with assistance of Argonaut. The game of course features racing across many tracks with different difficulties. You can select different accelerations, top speeds and car bodies before racing. You take control of these cartoonish, presumably sentient, car characters. With usable weapon items to take down other racers, collisions can happen between racers. You can boost, turn, drift, honk your horn, be a sigma. You get the idea. Kart Racer game. The game features five modes. Three for racing levels, one for obstacle courses, one for test driving, one for time attacking, and one for multiplayer racing. The game uses rudimentary but contemporarily advanced 3D polygonal graphics. The lack of speed is incorporated into gameplay by featuring cars that are heavier and clumsier than in conventional racing games. Sales-wise, the game was successful, with over 1 million sales by 1998 and generally saw positive to mixed reviews, with its most recent attention from Nintendo being its addition to the Nintendo Switch Online service in September 2019, its first re-release in more than two decades. Urban Champion Another one of Nintendo's 80s arcade cabinet games that did ultimately get an NES release. Urban Champion was published in 1984 and was developed and published solely by Nintendo. It is actually Nintendo's first 2D fighting game, with gameplay containing possibly some of the simplest fighting I've ever seen. The objective is to knock the other player into a sewer manhole. There is a 99 second time limit and the player has a set limit of stamina displayed as 200 hit points. The player has two types of attacks, a light punch and a heavy punch. The light punch is weaker but faster and harder to block, while the heavy punch is stronger but takes longer to pull off and is more easily telegraphed, and is thus easier to block. AKA, you have small punch, you have big punch, knock yourself out. Each punch costs the player 1 stamina. Flower pots are occasionally dropped from windows, which will cost the fighter 5 stamina and stun them if they are hit. When a player is knocked off the pavement, they advance to the next street. After every third fight, the opponent is knocked into a manhole. Then the player has a brief celebration where a lady throws confetti from a window. The goal of the game is to reach the rank of champion. Urban champion. The game has been called boring, tedious, a myriad of negative reviews met it following its release, and generally it seems Urban Champion has gone down with less glory than its contemporaries as one of Nintendo's less fruitful arcade bouts. Snipper Clips or as its full title is, Snipper Clips Cut It Out Together, was this co-op puzzle game Nintendo released as a launch title for the Nintendo Switch back in 2017. In the game, you play as one of two of these little paper-themed characters, either Snip or Clip. The players have a snipping mechanic, where they can cut the other player into a different shape, which is used to solve the game's various puzzles. Basically, when the two characters overlap each other, one player can snip the overlapped portion out of the other player, altering the shape of their body. Using this mechanic, players must come up with creative ways to solve various puzzles, each with unique objectives. Such such as fitting inside a shape template, carrying objects, or cutting out a pointed end in order to pop balloons. Additionally, up to four players can play the game's party and blitz mode. Party mode features unique puzzles designed for extra players, while blitz mode features various competitive games, such as basketball, hockey, and snipping death matches, along with the game's main mode with all its stages, of course. An updated version of Snipper Clips, titled Snipper Clips Plus, was released in November 2017. The updated version adds 30 new levels across two new worlds and some new modes to the original game. The game released a generally pretty positive review but never saw any further updates past the aforementioned update release. Which kind of makes sense because I feel like this game was more of an icebreaker to introduce audiences to the Switch. Because it very much feels like Nintendo might have been trying to rekindle the whole couch co-op, play with your friends and family, very casual appeal that the Wii originally had with its opening games. Thank you for listening to my thesis on the birth of Snipper Clips. Will we see Snip and Clip return for another adventure? Um, no. No, we probably won't.
Hotel Dusk Room 215. Hotel Dusk Room 215 is a point and click adventure game for the Nintendo DS. Originally titled as Wish Room, the game was developed by the now defunct Sing and published by Nintendo. It made its first public appearance in May 2006 at that year's E3 convention before first being released in 2007. In the game, the player as protagonist character and bitter ex-detective salesman Kyle Hyde must move around and interact with the game's environment using the DS's touchscreen and solve a variety of puzzles using the DS's hardware including the touchscreen, microphone and closable cover. Uniquely, the game is displayed vertically, not horizontally, and the DS system must be held rotated 90 degrees from normal, like a book, to properly view the game. Throughout the game, the player must speak with the various hotel patrons and employees in order to uncover vital information and at the end of most chapters, must interrogate a major character in a manner somewhat similar to a boss fight, with the ultimate goal of the game being to track down a missing friend and unravel the secrets of the mysterious room in Hotel Dusk Room 215, which is rumoured to be able to grant wishes. A sequel to the game, Last Window The Secrets of Cape West, was released again for the DS in 2010, which follows the same protagonist and uses the same vertical motif but deals with a new mystery in a new location and it also delves into some unanswered questions from Kyle Hyde's past. Highly interesting things from this game if I do say so myself. Last Window was the last game developed by Singh before the company filed for bankruptcy on the 1st of March 2010, which basically killed any chances of this franchise returning. Pushmo. Pushmo, or as it is called in Europe and Australia, Pool Blocks, is a downloadable puzzle game intelligent systems developed and Nintendo published for the 3DS, which was downloadable through the eShop. In the game, you play as Mallow, a red, round sumo wrestling creature who's visiting Pushmo Park. Pushmo are these big block puzzle structures that are the main focus of the series. Players must shift around puzzle blocks in order to create steps and platforms, ultimately to reach children who have been trapped within the giant structures by making a path to go rescue them. And Mallow, who for such a small guy is insanely strong can push or pull these giant blocks apart or together to do so. Along with the game's included 250 plus levels, Pushmo also includes the Pushmo Studio, where players can create and share their own Pushmo puzzles which can be shared with QR codes. The game did well and saw a humble line of sequels, firstly 2012's Crashmo which adapted on the formula of moving puzzle blocks around by adding gravity mechanics so blocks will fall onto each other and stack and the game is generally a lot more difficult. The third game Pushmo World was released in 2014 which brought the original Pushmo format to the Wii U, and ultimately the most recent entry Stretch Mo was released for the 3DS in 2015, which introduced the ability to stretch pieces out in addition to pushing and pulling. All games in the Pushmo series for Nintendo 3DS and Wii U are no longer available due to the Nintendo eShop closure for those systems, so rest in peace Pushmo I guess. Personal Trainer Cooking, or as it is known in territories outside of North America, Cooking Guide Can't Decide What to Eat, is an interactive digital cookbook. Yeah, interesting. The game was developed by indie studio Indie Zero and Nintendo NSD, and of course published by Nintendo. Personal Trainer is a game that gives step-by-step -step instructions on how to cook from a range of 245 real-world dishes. The user is guided through the preparation and cooking process via audio narration and instructional video clips, and the user can use the Nintendo DS's voice recognition to proceed through each cooking step. Users can also choose recipes based on how many calories they have or what ingredients the user currently has at hand, among other options. The application also allows users to take notes and compile a shopping list and features functions such as a cooking- So yeah, this game literally turns your DS into what is more or less a helpful tool for cooking. Just prop up your DS on your kitchen counter and switch on personal trainer cooking next time you're cooking a new meal for the first time guys. Should go a long way. In North America, it is technically a part of the larger personal trainer series of games, with other stellar action packed titles such as Personal Trainer Walking and Personal Trainer Math. Yes, if you need your DS to help you with walking, this sounds like the series for you. Personal Trainer Cooking was the first game in the series and released in 2008, with the rest of the three game series releasing in the few years following it. Rusty's Real Deal Baseball. This was a downloadable free-to-play baseball video game published and developed by Nintendo for the Nintendo 3DS eShop in 2013. The game features a host of 10 baseball-themed minigames, which can be purchased individually from Rusty, the mascot dog character who's basically going through a midlife crisis in the game. Poor Rusty, in his store called Rusty Slugger's Sports Shack. The player is given a free demo of one of the minigames, but will eventually need to pay for them to access them to their full extent. The game has a pretty inventive and unusual mechanic in your ability to haggle and negotiate with Rusty to lower the actual price of the minigame, which can be done through dialogue interactions with him before you purchase a minigame with real money. So there is literally a way to lower the price you have to pay to access the games from the eShop for Rusty's Real Deal Baseball, and it is heavily encouraged by Rusty and the game's NPCs. The purchasable minigames all feature fun spins on baseball minigame gameplay, with them all of course being tied together with the hub and menus of Rusty's shop and the game's world and characters. Since after the Nintendo 3DS's eShop closure, you can't buy the minigames anymore, but you can still access all the free-to-play parts of the game if you have it. And 
that's pretty much where the game has left off, mostly unplayable, but it's gone down as one of the more infamous eShop titles the 3DS is home to. Style Savvy, or as it is known in PAL regions, Style Boutique, and in Japan, Wagamama Fashion Girls Mode, is a fashion video game developed by Sin Sophia and published by Nintendo, released for the Nintendo DS in October 2008 and 2009. Style Savvy is played by holding the DS sideways, and the game utilizes the clock and date settings on the system. There are eight locations where the player can buy clothes, accessories, change hairstyles, change outfits, and work on their shop by managing items, making ads, and more. After fulfilling the fashion needs of your stylish character, you can compete in a modern modeling catwalk competition where you can earn a rare item. Oh my god, wait, what did I get? What rare item did I get? Congratulations, you got 10 views on a 3 hour long video mate, fucking well done. The game was followed up by three sequels for the Nintendo 3DS called Style Savvy Trendsetters, Style Savvy Fashion Forward, and Style Savvy Styling Star. With each game introducing new elements like apartments to customize, running your own boutique, new cities and characters, plot lines, just generally adapting on the series aesthetic and expanding on the Style Savvy format. The series hasn't seen a new mainline entry since Style Savvy Styling Star for the 3DS in 2017. Fluidity is a two-game series that was developed by Curve Studios and published by Nintendo, with its first entry a WiiWare title in 2010, Fluidity, and its subsequent sequel a 3DS eShop title in 2012, Fluidity Spin Cycle, both focusing on water. The Fluidity titles are 2D puzzle, somewhat platforming games, where you have to navigate a pool of water throughout several stages presented as pages of a magical encyclopedia known as the Aquaticus, which has been infected by a dark substance called the Influence. The player must collect rainbow drops by surmounting obstacles and completing environmental puzzles in order to rid the book of the influence. You do so with gyro controls by tilting the Wiimote or 3DS to tilt the in-game world which moves the water around with physics very similar to a mobile game called Where's My Water if you've ever played that. The pool of water gains the ability to transform into two other states, a block of ice and a cloud of vapor as the game progresses which come with their own unique physics and perks. The sequel, Fluidity Spin Cycle, performed too poorly for any follow-ups and so the series has been largely forgotten in 2012. Archaic Sealed Heat Ash Archaic Sealed Heat is a 2007 tactical role-playing game developed by studios Mistwalker and Ras Jin and published by Nintendo for the DS exclusively in Japan. In the game, players take on the role of protagonist Asia and her army in battles against enemy forces, progressing through a series of turn-based combat encounter battles across a chapter-based narrative. The game is controlled using the Nintendo DS stylus, with the display split between its two screens. The top screen is used for displaying cutscenes and the battle party, while the bottom screen is used for party control and shows the enemy party in battle. The game was designed again by Final Fantasy creator Hironobu Sakaguchi, who acted as executive producer, writer, and designer for the game. Plot wise, well, according to, uh, <coughs> according to Google, the storyline follows protagonist Aisia, princess of millennia after her kingdom is burned to ashes by a fire monster on her coronation day. She gains the ability to revive the dead as ash-formed bodies and sets out to investigate the cause behind the disaster. Very mysterious very mysterious. The game didn't sell that impressively, not terribly, but it wasn't anything remarkable, especially given the studio and names behind the project, and it saw no sequel or following up following its release. Although I feel like this game is just every RPG ever, so I'm not surprised. Luxley's Lineup. Luxley's Lineup was this DSi title you could download from the eShop that was developed by Goodfeel, the same people responsible for Kirby's Epic Yarn and Yoshi's Crafted World and published by Nintendo in 2010. The game has the same loving and careful sort of DIY arts and crafts aesthetic as their later works do that gives the game the same childlike charm. Basically the game is a hidden picture book game, where you are presented with visual environments and you have to discover hidden items and pictures within them, kind of like Where's Wally or Where's Waldo if you're a fat bastard. The game uses these 3D pop-up book environments that you can look through to do so. You have to hold the DS vertically again in this game, and overall the game just does a lot to contribute to its cosy aesthetic, which I have to admire. By tilting the DS, you can move the environment around and see into all its nooks and crannies to uncover the hidden things you need to find for Luxley the Rabbit, the series' main character, to finish the fairy tale story he's writing. With the shutdown of the eShop, unfortunately the game is no longer accessible to those who didn't already have it installed. And considering how obscure and weirdly hard to research the game is, I can't see Nintendo or Goodfeel rebooting it for another installation. Harmonite. So Harmonite is this rhythm-based platformer side-scrolling game Game Freak developed that was released as an eShop title for the 3DS in 2012. The game takes place in a fictional mystical world called Melodia, with all its locations, characters and environments, and basically the game's whole aesthetic being designed around the theming of music. Players control a young boy named Tempo as he travels through automatically scrolling levels. The main gameplay is limited to two buttons, the B button for jumping and the A button to swing Tempo's staff. The goal of each level is to gather as many notes as possible, either by simply 
finding them, hitting enemies, or hitting musical plants across each stage. All of these actions are done on beat with the rhythm of the music in the stage. The game is all 2D, save for some mock 3D segments which appear 3-dimensional but just have you moving monodirectionally across a different axis, and has some boss fights as well which are to be fought against the beat of the music as well. The game seems to have released to some pretty decent reviews, especially for an eShop title, but hasn't really seen any follow-ups to speak of since its 2012 release. Mole Mania. Released in 1996 for the Game Boy, Mole Mania is a game where you play as a mole. More specifically, this little guy, Muddy the Mole. As you navigate several top-down 2D areas by moving a black ball to a gate at the end of the screen in order to advance to the next. So, in a similar format, progression-wise, to advancing between dungeon areas in the original Legend of Zelda, if you will. He can push, pull, and throw the black ball. Muddy can also dig into soft ground to find underground paths around obstacles. Choosing where to dig is a crucial element of the game's various puzzles, as creating a Holes in the wrong areas could ruin the player's plans and make advancing more difficult or impossible. Dropping the ball into a hole would cause it to return to its starting point. Digging holes in the wrong places could make reaching the gate with the ball completely impossible, so there is certainly an element of planning and strategy to the game. Along the way, there are many obstacles, such as moving enemies, pipes, barrels, weights, and boss fights. The game saw no sequel, sadly, despite seeing positive critical acclaim after its release. And to be honest, as unlikely as it does seem, I wouldn't mind seeing a reboot or a continuation of the Mole Mania franchise. Its gameplay actually looks pretty interesting, and with a graphical update, to modern standards, I think Nintendo could actually do something here. And I think Muddy the Mole's kind of a chad, to be honest. Muddy the Mole for Smash? Maybe? Nah, I'm just kidding. Unless. English Training. The English Training series is a series of English training games published by Nintendo released between 2006 to 2009, which as the title implies, all centre around teaching the English language to non-native speakers, an educational series really. The games include tests, comprised of several activities and daily challenges with both written and spoken activities, in addition to letting the player freely practice any test without receiving a score. The game also includes multi- uh, multiplayer support. How the fuck does it- <laughs> The series has four games, which all focus on pretty much the exact same thing, just being compilations of educational tasks assisting with the learning of the English language, having you type, write, listen, and comprehend English sentences and phrases. The games were all released either as DS physical titles or just DSiWare titles. Funnily enough, and well, logically enough, they were all pretty much only released in Asia and other generally non-English speaking countries. Super Control Mecha MG In a world where giant robots known as Marionation Gear, MG for short, or puppets, are handcrafted in workshops for battle, a certain boy serves as an apprentice at a workshop dreaming of becoming a mecha pilot as he works away with his fellow aspiring robot pilots. But their peaceful daily life is shattered one day when an evil army of autonomous robot giants known as the Auto Men begin going on berserk rampages around the world. Together with new apprentice Anne-Marie, the hero and Kay are pulled into a conflict that could change the course of puppet history. And so is the story of Chosujo Mecha or Super Control Mecha in English, a game where the player can access and control over 100 unique mecha robot fighters to play as during battle over 120 different missions throughout the game's runtime. The most notable unique feature of the game is probably its use of the DS's dual screen, with the top one displaying the gameplay, what's going on, and the actual robot action, and the bottom one being a control screen, or a cockpit as the game dubs it, where you can carry out multiple commands like pulling levers, pressing buttons and dials, etc., to control your mecha in battle. With each of the 100 plus playable mechs in the game having their own unique cockpit. Players can pull levers to swing their robot's arms and hurl buildings at the enemy, flip a switch to transform into a car, punch in launch codes to fire missiles, and countless other imaginative setups. With well over 100 missions, ranging from battle to racing to destroying burger joints, with each mecha being specialised to different uses, the game was largely praised for its unique use of the DS's screens and went on to see cameos in Smash Bros long after its release in 2006, but it was never localised outside of Japan. Gift Pier. As we get further into this iceberg, a lot of the games I mention are going to be Japan-only releases. And this is another one of them, Gift Pier. Was a video game developed by Skip Limited and published by Nintendo for the GameCube in 2003. Gift Pier follows the protagonist, Pockle, a resident of Nanashi Island who, on the day of his coming-of-age ceremony, oversleeps and misses the whole thing. The mayor of the island becomes so angry that he orders Pockle's arrest and charges him a fine of 5 million main, the game's currency, to compensate for the costs of the event. So it's it's up to Pockle and therefore the player to work off the huge debt throughout the course of the game. At the beginning of the game, Pockle must deal with heavy restrictions. An early curfew, being attached to a ball and chain, having his face pixelated, which for some reason just comes off as really weird to me, but okay. And having this robot police chief, Mappo, supervise him. Throughout his adventure, Pockle is assisted by his dog Tao and his girlfriend Kiappa, along with other supporting cast members. Pockle eventually encounters an old man who will give him some mushroom soup and teach him about other paths to adulthood via helping others. 
peculiar game, very peculiar. The series doesn't really follow an inherent act by act or stage by stage structure. It's more like Animal Crossing in the sense it just centers around interacting with others in a day to day life in order to meet the game's 5 million main requirements. The players must initially take menial jobs such as fishing, collecting fruit or repairing signs. And after meeting the old man, the player must travel the island, collecting its residents' wishes and fulfill them. Interesting game. You as the player are also responsible for making Pockle eat so he doesn't starve to death. Huh. No sequels for this game. It never made it out of Japan, as I said. And to be honest, this might be the most Japanese game I have ever seen. And I think it looks absolutely brilliant. Where is Gift Pier 2, Nintendo? Give it to me. I want Gift Pier 2. I want it now. Freaky Forms. So seeing this on the iceberg actually brought back some memories for me because I remember always seeing this game when I was little and wanting to play it, but I never did. Now I get to live out my childhood dreams vicariously through an iceberg video that will get 10 views, yay. So Freaky Forms was this creature creator platformer game that game studio Acerbism developed which Nintendo published for the 3DS in 2011. In the game, you create one of your own unique playable character creatures known as a Formy. Formies are created using various different colored parts and shapes placed however the player decides. You can give it however many eyes, arms, legs, Legs, antenna, or anything you want. After the character is completed, players can use the touchscreen to navigate the Formy throughout the game's world and its platforming areas. After the player explores, they are asked to complete assigned tasks within a given time limit, such as collecting a number of items, eating certain items, or assisting other characters. After playing the game enough, you'll unlock AR functionality, which is pretty basic in this game and is kind of just a little camera spectacle. And you could also share your Formies via Street Pass or with QR codes. Freaky Forms went on to receive a deluxe edition a year after its release in 2012, which introduced online multiplayer, allowing for you and your buddies to create your own formies together to explore dungeons and have RPG-style combat encounters somehow. The deluxe edition actually did replace the original version on the eShop, so I guess it was more of an update than a remaster of any kind. A bit like infamous non-Nintendo video game sequel Overwatch 2. Battle Clash. But as it is known in Japan, Space Bazooka, I know which title I like more. I like Battle Clash more. Is another SNES game Nintendo published, this one in 1992, which is meant to be played using one of Nintendo's accessories, this time not the NES Zapper, but the Super Scope. Set in a distant future Earth, which is living in absolute chaos, Battle Clash has you play as the gunner of an ST, one of many gigantic anthropomorphic machines called Standing Tanks, while fighting against the evil ST opponents of the antagonist forces led by villain Anubis, as you fight to avenge the dead father of your co-pilot. The gameplay of Battle Clash boils down to mecha 1v1 fights in these ST, with you using the super scope to attack your enemy. You can shoot rapid quick fire shots, charge up for heavier shots, or fire a special shot called an energy bolt when your energy bar fills up. Of course, doing all this while trying to dodge and avoid your enemy's attacks in order to come out of the encounter victorious. Although not of the same name, Battle Clash did receive a successor game with 1993's Metal Combat Falcon's Revenge, also for the SNES, which has largely the same gameplay, with you now being able to pilot a choice of two mechs, the Falcon from the original game and the Tornado, which is a new introduction. The game is set three years after the events of the first and features Anubis coming back for revenge, and apparently ends in it being revealed Anubis is just a small part of a much greater threat which involves a race of aliens called the Eltorians who have come to conquer Earth. The plot thickens. Both games released a generally pretty average to mixed reviews, and Falcon's Revenge was the last installment the series has seen. Aliens. Nintendo Pocket Football Club is a game that does what it says on the tin. Released for the 3DS in 2012, Nintendo Pocket Football Club is basically a football manager simulation game where you can assemble and manage your own team of these little pixelated Funko Pop-esque football players down to customizing their kits, the club's logo, what country you play in, and of course managing their tactics throughout the football matches that play out in real time. You can train your team's players, improve their skills, level them up basically to improve performance. It was hard to find exact information on the formatting of the game, but I think you start playing in these sort of fields parks, run down pitches, and slowly work your way up the ranks of football until you're playing in stadiums with larger crowds and more prestige to your players. Before each match, you'll decide what strategies and techniques you want your players to use, before sending them off to play in real time while you spectate, being able to make adjustments where you see fit at points throughout to be set for victory. The game is a successor to and reimagining of the Game Boy Advance title Calcio Bit, which was released in 2006 and was largely the same as Pocket Football Club. The games met praise for their aesthetics, good customization, and personalizable elements, but were criticized for their lack of, well, gameplay really. You just set your team off and then watch them play, you don't play yourself. And so the series' lack of responsiveness at times dragged it down quite a bit critically, it would seem. 
and Kensaku. A Wii game Nintendo published and developed in cooperation with Google of all people. And Kensaku was a Japan only release in 2010 and can best be described as a mini game compilation focused on Google search statistics. Yeah, more specifically 14 of them. The mini games are hosted by this little TV head chibi looking robot character Ando Kensaku. And all the games like I mentioned somehow center around Google search terms and analytics basically and most can be played with up to four players. For example, one game has players choose between topics aiming to choose the one with the lowest amount of Google searches. Another one has you extending a staircase to climb higher, with the player being able to cause more steps to appear by choosing the search terms with the highest amount of searches. The mini games are all split into three divisions, called First Time Kinsaku Mode, Basic Kinsaku Mode, and lastly, And Kinsaku Mode. The game hasn't been translated into English, so it's a little hard to see what kind of search terms we're looking at here, so if there are any Japanese readers, please enlighten us in the comments. Some mini games featured additional content that could have been downloaded with Nintendo Wi Fi connections, such as updated search terms and new questions for some of the mini games. But with the termination of this service on May 20th, 2014, it is no longer possible to download these new terms and questions. How sad. And Kinsaku was unfortunately Nintendo's last collab with Google and has stayed that way for over a decade, although there are rumours on Reddit of them working with Google to create a VR headset, so really, who knows. Card Hero. Published for the Game Boy Color after development from Nintendo R&D 1 and Intelligent Systems in Japan exclusively in 2001. Trade and Battle Card Hero. The first game of the Card Hero series is a card collecting, trading and battling game. Focusing around the protagonist Hiroshi, this painfully cliche looking anime boy, as he trains his skills in the in-game game Card Hero in hopes of becoming a master by dueling and interacting with several other opponents. So, Yu-Gi-Oh, basically. His goal becomes harder to achieve when a malicious group, the Jokers, cause trouble in town. The game features the classic Pokemon RPG-esque overworld to navigate through, with all the secrets and nuances you can expect from that. And the core catch of the game, the card battles, consist of these 1v1 battles. You play with your cards, of which there are really four types, your master card, which is basically your player. If your master card's HP is depleted and is defeated, you lose the game. There's monster cards, basically the Pokemon of the game if you will, you use them to attack and fight the battle mostly. There's super monster cards, which are a bit more gimmicky and harder to get into play, but are much more powerful. And there are magic cards, which can of course buff, heal, deal damage, all par for the core star. So more or less, it's the classic Pokemon slash Digimon style RPG game, just with a more unique battle style that isn't necessarily direct creature versus creature combat. In 2007, the DS saw a sequel to the first game called Kosoku Card Battle Card Hero, which this time around is in 3D and I believe follows largely the same gameplay format, with slightly altered card gameplay maybe. Fling Smash. So Fling Smash was this motion controlled centered gimmicky action game that Nintendo released for the Wii in 2010. The game was essentially created to showcase the ability of the Wii Motion Plus accessory, a further add on for the Wii Mote which improved the responsiveness and accuracy of its motion controls. This game, Fling Smash, centering around you flinging this little yellow creature called Zip into walls, stones, bricks, boxes, obstacles, collectible items, anything really, to smash them and progress through several side scrolling stages. You doing so by, of course, vigorously wagging the Wii Mote in the direction you want to propel Zip into. The game consists of eight worlds, each of which consists of three levels. In each level, the screen will scroll constantly in one direction. The direction depends on the stage and a Wii remote hand. The game's plot consists of trying to take down the evil antagonist Ominous, who plans to take over this fictional tropical island, and of course it's down to this weird yellow red-haired blob to do so. Players must collect a pearl to complete the level. To collect a pearl, players will need to find three medals. Medals are hidden within each stage and are sometimes carried by enemies that the player must hit. Collect three Three worlds in each world to fight the boss, rinse and repeat, you get it. It's a motion control game, really. This does feel like sort of the epitome of the random weird motion controlled Wii title that you kind of half remember playing ages ago but can't tell if it was just a fever dream or an actual game that you played. The game does have some co-op mini games aside from the main story mode also for what that's worth. Famicom Grand Prix. The series that could perhaps be considered the patient zero of Mario Kart racers. The SNES's Famicom Grand Prix F1 race released in Japan only in 1987. And its sequel, the SNES's Famicom Grand Prix 2 3D Hot Rally, also released in Japan exclusively later in 1988, are the two games that make up the Famicom Grand Prix series. Both games are kart racers. Although Mario and Luigi do appear as the racers in the game, the game adopts a much more realistic aesthetic and world than the later Mario Kart games do, so it isn't really that comparable visually. But gameplay wise, the first game uses a sort of top down view of racing around tracks, with laps and fairly primitive gameplay with little obstacles and no items to speak of. Collisions with other racers are still possible though. And the second game, 3D Hot Rally, features this mock 3D visual presentation and gameplay, similar to games like Rad Racer, which once you get past the fact it's in 3D, is largely similar to the simple racing gameplay of the first game, just with a slightly different way of travelling. There are checkpoints to fix and repair any damage your vehicle may have suffered during races 
races throughout the game and not much more to speak of here. Both are relatively simple early racing games which serve as an interesting peek into Nintendo racing series before the emergence of Mario Kart. Bit Generations So Bit Generations was a series of seven games, all originally published for the GameCube Advance that were released in two waves. The first, Series 1 as it was dubbed, on July 13th, 2006, and Series 2 on July 27th, 2006. Each of the games in the series feature simple controls, gameplay and graphics, and take into focus a different gameplay style, set of mechanics and subject of play each. For example, the first game of the series, called Boundish, is a more elaborate Pong style game with four playable modes, each one offering a unique spin on the Pong format format, allowing for multiplayer and using, as all the games do, a very simple and very digital aesthetic style. Another game in the series, Colorist, takes grids of multicolored squares and offers a color swapping puzzle solving playstyle, having you swap the colors of individual tiles to create rows of the same color to eliminate them and fill up a meter at the top of the screen, with there being grids of increasing size and complexity the further into the game you progress. Another game in the series called Dot Stream has you control these colored dot slash lines as you race across the screen horizontally, trying to avoid obstacles and reach the end against five other different coloured dots. The challenge coming from managing your speed as making any diagonal movements will slow you down. So you get the idea, it is a weird eclectic collection of games, all of which are on separate cartridges may I remind you, that were released initially in Japan only. Eventually they did see WiiWare and DSi releases under the series name Art Style in around 2009 I believe. But past that, with the name Bit Generations, the series never truly made its way out of Japan. Slide Adventure Mag Kid, released for the DS in 2007 in Japan only. Slide Adventure Mag Kid is a game designed around the idea of sliding. So much so, the game as the project it was itself was actually designed as more or less a showcase of this slide controller accessory for the DS, which you could attach to the bottom of your DS to turn the system into basically a mouse. As you can see here, by sliding the DS around on a surface with the slide controller attachment, you can control your movement in the game. No D-pad or analog control required. In the game, you play as this little guy called Mag kid, who actually has one of the more complex and nuanced backstories of any character made by Nintendo, that being that he is a fridge magnet who came to life when it was struck by lightning. It's genius really, absolute genius. The game has you slipping and sliding into enemies and obstacles and game elements to solve puzzles across its action gameplay. Now I can't read Japanese as we've said so it's hard to interpret exactly what the game is like thematically and story wise. It seems to involve lots of desktop, schoolwork, almost stationary elements to compose its levels and characters, so I can't imagine we're dealing with world ending narratives here. Maybe more on the scale of Chibi Robo for example, having you enter books and slide between pages to travel to different areas and such. But yeah, hope to see Mag Kid the Magical Fridge Magnet return in the future. Chi Chai Alien. Exclusive to the Game Boy Color, Chi Chai Alien is a game developed and published by Japanese game company Creatures Incorporated in 2001 in Japan only. The game makes use of the Game Boy Color's infrared sensor of all things, and using that the player has to point the Game Boy Color in the direction of any artificial light. For example, pointing the system at a lamp in your room or your ceiling light, which will reveal one of the many collectible titular characters the game centers around, the Chai Aliens. The Chai Aliens can be interacted with, loosely similar to Pokemon and Tamagotchi, and have their dark matter extracted to advance the story. Playing with the Chalians in the Polariton allows for the player to unlock their minigames, and that's where the core gameplay resides, in these minigames each Chai Alien can unlock for the player. It's an odd premise to explain, I'll admit, like a blend of the creature collecting of Pokemon, gimmicky infrared mechanics, and minigame collections all in a space setting. The game did see two successors, using the Chi Chai Alien idea and IP, but not true sequels. Firstly was 2005's No 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 Puzzle Chalian for the Game Boy Advance, a puzzle game that used the Chi Chai Alien character in its three playable minigames. And secondly, and most recently, was the 2010 DSiWare title Spin 6. And this is a pretty cryptic and weird release to really research properly, which was another puzzle game involving rotating coloured panels to line them up and make them disappear, but I think was actually just a re-release of one of the three minigames from No 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 Puzzle Chalian, just with a removed battle mode. I don't know. It's at this point in the iceberg the formatting of some of these series is starting to get confusing, especially with them being obscure Japanese only pieces of media. And trust me, we are going to be seeing a lot of obscure Japanese only pieces of media as we go into the abyss of the Nintendo iceberg.
Yaku Man, a 1989 Game Boy title focusing on gameplay of the real-world Chinese tile-based game Mahjong. Yaku Man followed two earlier NES titles which also simulated Mahjong play, initially with the simply titled Mahjong in 1983 and 1984's Four Nin Uchi Mahjong. Yaku Man is also the first game in the Yaku Man series with such a title and preceded seven sequels. Only being released in Japan, the game, as I mentioned, takes a focus on the real game of Mahjong. It was the only game of the original four Japanese Game Boy release titles to never be localized outside of Japan, alongside Super Mario Land, Alleyway, and Baseball. Japanese Mahjong is a four-player tile-based game, where the goal is to take points from other players by drawing and discarding tiles until a winning hand is made. A Yakuman is a class of rare and valuable winning hands that can be composed of different combinations of tiles than normal hands, so that's where the game gets its name. The Mahjong in Yakuman is a two-player variation of this game, which is ordinarily four-player, like I said. All the following games basically follow the exact same format, just with graphics upgrades and the expected advances in quality sequels have. A progression towards traditional four-player gameplay and even having the games include Mario characters and be hosted by Miis in later DS releases. The most recent game was Yakuman Hau in 2015. Regenlev. Zangeki no Regenlev, published by Nintendo, developed by Sandlot and released for the Wii in 2010, is the only game in the Regenlev series. A 3D action game with a heavy focus on Norse mythology for its world. In the game, you play as the divine warriors Freya and Freyja in their war against the Jotun, which herald the coming of Ragnarok. So yeah, basically the whole game has a mythologically Norse setting with gods like Thor, Odin, and Loki appearing throughout. In the game, you have to fight off hordes of enemies as they invade several cities throughout Midgard. Gameplay is mission based, with you having to fight off waves of enemies horde style to complete them. There are analog controls or motion controls which allow you to slash and swing your swords as you can expect from a 2010 Wii game, with missions being set in open landscapes populated by enemies for you to defeat, which makes this look like it could become a Hyrule Warriors game awfully easily if we just swapped out some of the characters here. There are five difficulty settings for each mission, easy, normal, hard, hardest and inferno. Each ascending difficulty is unlocked upon clearing a mission on the previous one. Despite only being a officially released in Japan, a prominent English fan translation by Brand Newman and Gummy has made the game consumable to Western audiences, thankfully. And Regan Lev was actually the first Nintendo game to ever receive a D rating, aka a mature rating, for its bloodier content. Tact of Magic Tact of Magic is a Wii game developed by Studio Taito and released by Nintendo in 2009 in Japan that never made it to the rest of the world. The game is a spiritual successor to the DS game Lost Magic and has similar gameplay though it is not a sequel. You're given control of Orwell and Charlotte, two childhood friends who face off on the battlefield against monsters and enemy soldiers. Gameplay consists of navigating a 3D semi-RPG-like overworld while utilizing the main gimmick of the game, holding the Wii remotes like a wand and drawing various shapes to perform over 100 different spells, which is quite preposterous. In addition to casting magic, you are also given control of a battle party which you can build and customise with different mages, beasts and ally characters, who you direct on the battlefield from an overhead perspective. Its spiritual predecessor, the DS's Lost Magic in 2006, opts to make the player draw spells on the touchscreen with a stylus to cast them and carry out actions, and lets you capture monsters and make them fight for you. And yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about Tact of Magic. So, um... Uh, so, uh... Sute Hakun. Sute Hakun is a 1997 action puzzle game featuring a character of the same name, this little bubbly beaked bottle fella. Developed by Indie Zero with Nintendo R&D 2 and published by Nintendo for the Super Famicom's add-on The Satellaview, which was available for download via data casting in 1997, and three different updates involving new puzzles were released from 1998 to 1999. The game, in essence, is a side-scrolling platforming puzzle game. You play as this little bottle bird, as I mentioned, called Hakun. You can run, jump, and absorb or deposit different materials and fluids to solve puzzles using these blocks which are all over the game. In each stage, you have to gather all the rainbow shards that are scattered around and hidden behind puzzles. And naturally, as the game goes on, the puzzles get more and more complex and intricate. Several types of traps and characters are prepared in each level, some of which help Hakun, and others which may obstruct his path. The most important of these are the red, blue, and yellow bottles and transparent blocks. Hakun can suck out colours from each bottle and insert them into the transparent blocks to make them move in different directions. There there are five versions of the game, which all came with lots of new extra levels, four of them releasing for Satellaview and one in cartridge form. The last new version was Sute Hakun 98 Winter Events version, which was released in 1998 for the Satellaview. Compose and Sing Monkey Band 
A DSI title released in April 2010. From what I could gather, Make and Sing Monkey Band is composed of one simple premise. Writing a song, composing a song, and having this band of monkeys perform it for you. The lead singer, Monkey, will read out lyrics you've written in this somewhat dystopian Vocaloid-like speech production, with the accompaniment of the rest of the band in this jungle setting, and going by various obscure internet sources, some other locales, like a beach and a rather dingy looking alleyway. So there's probably quite a few areas to play around with. The game is one of the first really obscure ones on the iceberg, with it costing 800 points for a download from the DSiWare store and being now undownloadable, it's easy to see why it's so elusive. In fact, the only footage you can really find of it consistently on YouTube are just multiple uploads of the same 2010 trailer. Yoyuki. Famicom Mukashi Banashi Yoyuki, translated as Famicom Fairy Tales Yoyuki, is a text-based adventure game developed by Nintendo and Pax Sofnica and published by Nintendo exclusively in Japan for the Famicom. It is the second of the Famicom Mukashi Banashi series, following the release of Shin Onigashima. Yuyuki is an adventure game played by choosing from several text commands shown on screen to advance the narrative displayed in the frame to the top right of the screen. It resembles its predecessor, Shin Onigashima, in its implementation of the change character command, allowing you to switch between several playable characters depending on where you are in the story, as well as its usage of traditional Japanese fairy tales and general screen layout and visuals. The storyline of Yuyuki is a parody of the Chinese novel Journey to the West, where two main characters, Goku and Chao, embark upon separate journeys to find one another. And yeah, by the looks of it, the gameplay of Yoyuki is very, very simple, just having the player select from different text options to further the narrative. Tomato Adventure. One of the most bizarre and tragically underrated RPG games Nintendo has ever published. Tomato Adventure is a single player game developed by Alpha Dream and published by Nintendo for the Game Boy Advance in January 2002 in Japan only. It's an RPG game, like I said, much in the same vein as the Mario and Luigi games stylistically and gameplay wise, with there of course being an overworld with lots of characters and secrets to discover. The game follows a story beginning in the Ketchup Kingdom, where the protagonist, Demil, who's this rabbit-like boy, has his girlfriend and kidnapped by the evil antagonist King Abira. The overarching goal of the game of course being to save Demil's girlfriend, doing so by venturing across several different themed worlds, which contrary to what you'd expect from a presumably food and vegetable themed game called Tomato Adventure, are composed of toy worlds, sunken Christmas decorated ships, and jailhouse rock style prisons. Oh, and also biological abominations of landscapes, just thrown in there, you know, casually. And going through every village to obtain the missing parts of a robot that can give anyone access into the gimmick path. Alice, a tower-like structure with a tomato on it, where you will save Demil's girlfriend. Combat isn't from random encounters, but from enemies wandering around in the overworld you can run into to trigger the party RPG encounters. And the game's main unique gimmick in its gameplay is how you perform attacks. Instead of scrolling through menus and items to do so, you perform short minigame-like activities, and do damage and perform accordingly to how well you executed them. Kind of like the meter thing in Undertale, I guess, just with lots of different variations on it. And to be honest, I wouldn't mind another Tomato Adventure game. The character designs and world are all really inspired, and I reckon with the love of modern Nintendo, we could have something rather preposterous on our hands here. Senen Kazoku. Senen Kazoku is a Game Boy Advance game released in 2005 by Nintendo and developed again by Indie Zero. The game was released exclusively in Japan and has remained there without translation ever since. In the game, you play as Cupid, who was ordered to watch over a family by God. And as Cupid, your task is to make sure that the family is protected through its generations and continues into the future. Gameplay has you spending the majority of your time watching the characters live their lives as they do daily actions, have major moments in their life, and eventually die. Your goal as Cupid is to make sure that the family continues on, like I said. To do this, you'll make use of different emotional arrows that'll change their course. While the character of Cupid traditionally is viewed purely as a love-influencing entity, in this game his arrows will have a variety of effects, ranging from making a character work harder, calming them down, and, as expected, making a character fall in love, which you can use yourself to advance the family line and keep it going into the future. The game also, like Animal Crossing or Tomodachi Life, uses a real-time clock to base its happenings off, so major events within the family's individual lives could be missed when you aren't playing. And honestly, I think this might be one of my favourite takes on the day-to-day, -day, internal clock-dependent, Animal Crossing-esque formula. 
with how unorthodox and pretty interesting honestly the way you intervene with the people in game is i just think the idea of cupid in this game is pretty cool with all the different emotional arrows you can use and the game's aesthetic is also pretty nice it's vibrant it's interesting Set and kazoku just looks just looks good it just looks like a good game among us Shin Onigashima, as I mentioned, is the spiritual predecessor to Yuyuki. It's an adventure game, more or less identical in format and style to Yuyuki. You use the same command selection to advance through the game, and the game utilizes the same distinct change character command. The characters can move through the story separately at times, and may be called upon to do tasks that the other main character cannot accomplish on their own. The use of this command in certain situations can trigger dialogue particular to each character, bringing out the peculiarities of each. How propos- <coughs> How, how peculiar, how peculiar. The main thing separating this from Yoyuki is its different cast of characters, which don't use any pre-existing stories, but their own original characters by Nintendo R&D4 and Pax Sofnica, like protagonist Donbei, this little blue-haired caveman boy, among others. The game's made up of two separate discs. The first disc was released on September 4th, 1987, while the second disc was released September 30th. And you have to exchange discs while the Famicom system is powered on to advance to disc 2, which you also do have to do in Yoyuki. I mean, this is pretty much just Yoyuki except it was released earlier than Yuyuki, so there's not much to say here. The main difference of Shin Onikoshima is, as I said, the different cast. Soma Bringer. Set across the magical fictional continent of Barnea, which is dependent on this miracle substance called Soma, which powers everything from household appliances to weapons of war. Soma Bringer is a 2008 action RPG Nintendo published for the DS after its development by Monolith Soft. You take control of one of eight main playable characters, who are all a part of a military division called Farzuf Division 7, navigating your way through the 3D RPG open world from top-down perspectives on your quest to save the world from the visitors. Evil monsters that have suddenly appeared across Barnea and disrupted the magical Soma. Multiplayer functions allow up to three players to participate in exploration and combat at the same time, which sets it apart from your average ARPG. Enemy encounters are in real time, with hack and slash combat as you use your abilities, items and attacks to take down enemy visitors with your party of three characters. The game was released exclusively in Japan in February 2008. Upon its release, it was critically acclaimed by both Japanese and Western reviewers and saw good financial success in Japan, but was never officially localized outside of Japan, with an English fan translation by Rom hacker Darth Nemesis making it digestible for Western audiences. Later in the same year it was released. Sakura Samurai. Sakura Samurai Art of the Sword, or as this is known in North America and Power Regions, Hana Samurai Art of the Sword, is an action adventure game developed by Grounding Inc. and published by Nintendo as a Nintendo 3DS eShop title in November 2011. In the game, you take control of this young nameless samurai hero, who is the apprentice to an old Kappa master and gets dubbed the Sakura Samurai. You travel the game's world in pursuit of a kidnapped princess called Cherry Blossom as you encounter and fight ninjas, samurai, and other themed opponents along your quest to rescue her. You fight enemies in these 3D real-time battles in enclosed arenas, which take focus on timing, countering attacks, and precision, giving you extra points for good accuracy, and gold for defeating enemies which you can then spend on items like shurikens, frogs, rice balls, etc. You can also go around three of these small samurai village hub worlds, before continuing to the rest of the world map to access the game's main story. Completing the game's story and beating each boss fight will take the average player about four hours, but there is post-game content like enemy gauntlets, a sakura garden, and an expert mode for players who want more. Considering the game is a $7 eShop title, I'm impressed by how well made it looks, and I think this should have been developed into a fully fleshed out 3D samurai adventure series because that could really be successful in my opinion. Napoleon. Napoleon, not the movie or the person, but the Nintendo game, is a real-time strategy game developed by Genki and published by Nintendo as a Japanese launch title for the Game Boy Advance in 2001. The game was also published in France under the title L'Aigle de Guerre, literally meaning the Eagle of War in English. An unofficial fan English translation patch for the game was released in December 2018. As you could have guessed, in the game's story mode, players play as historical figure Napoleon Bonaparte, who leads his revolutionary army into battle against the British, aka the good guys. Nintendo's rendition of Napoleon's story is told in Fire Emblem-esque fashion gameplay-wise, having you organize your troops and select commanders to lead into battle across real-time strategic maps and including character dialogue cutscenes. However, the game does take many liberties with its historical accuracy. In the game, Napoleon isn't just fighting military oppositions accurate to real-life history, but he's also fighting against man-eating ogres and abominable snowmen. The objectives for the missions vary slightly, but the basic idea is to send out your units, defeat the enemy, and take over the opponent's stronghold. Think tactically, be red pilled, win. Skill issue, Napoleon for the Game Boy Advance. Not the movie, not the person, but the Nintendo game. 
Kiki Trick. This one is strange. Kiki Trick is a music party game developed and published by Nintendo for the Wii. The game was released in Japan on the 19th of January 2012, but was never released outside of Japan. In June 2017, the game was digitally re-released in Japan via the Nintendo eShop on the Wii U. It's more or less a minigame collection, as a lot of party games kind of are, with all the minigames revolving around audio-based objectives. The main mode of the game, also known as Noise and Friends, tasks players with deciphering garbled speech spoken by five different characters. Noise, Zebra, Madame, TV and Chuck. And there's more side games which include different eclectic objectives, more like a WarioWare type assortment of games, just sound based. Each side game is usually based around identifying sounds or speech, with varying degrees of complexity and difficulty. For example, this mini game where you have to count how many sounds were played from behind this door. Or the following one, where you have to put the heads of dogs and cats onto their respective bodies on an assembly line according to what sounds they make. Both of those examples, as do all the games, get increasingly difficult as they progress, with them speeding up or introducing more sounds all mixed together or other things to be harder to tell apart. It's odd but not too weird to be off-putting. The aesthetics are interesting enough, it definitely feels like a Japan-only release, which is saying a lot for a Nintendo game. But yeah, as I mentioned, Kiki Trick never made it out of Japan and has remained there exclusively for the entirety of its lifespan since its release in January 2012. Nintendoji, a game that was released as a download-only title for the 3DS as a customer loyalty reward for Gold and Platinum Club Nintendo members only in Japan. Yes, we are dealing with some rather obscure series now. In Nintendoji, you play as a priest known as Karabe, who must purify an abandoned city that's been cloaked in darkness, while extracting different treasures and relics along the way. You do so by travelling underneath the city through 50 lightly randomised floors. The game takes on a sort of dungeon-crawling RPG style of gameplay, with Karabe exploring the floors through the thick miasma that's all across the game's areas. Evil spirits also hide within the miasma and around the environments, although direct confrontation with these enemies isn't like other RPG games, as you can't really defeat evil spirits or engage with them favourably at all, since Karabe doesn't have any direct method of attack, so your best bet is to just try and avoid them. With the information you are provided, you can see how far away they are from Karabe and their rough location, which paired with the grid-based map on the bottom screen of the 3DS can let you figure out all their possible locations if you're smart enough. Karabe uses a variety of powerful elemental talismans in the game, to clear the miasma, to silence his footsteps to make him harder for spirits to detect, to phase through walls and other helpful abilities. As the title implies, the game incorporates elements from other Nintendo games, with the three main relics needed to purify the whole city in the first place being memorabilia from the Super Mario series, Mario's hat, a superstar and a hammer, which amidst the constantly eerie and foreboding atmosphere of the whole game, feel oddly out of place as the overarching collectible goal of the game. But hey, it is a club Nintendo game after all, I guess that does make sense. Project Hacker Project Hacker Kakasai, or Project Hacker Awakening, is a point-and-click adventure game developed by Red Entertainment and published by Nintendo for the Nintendo DS in 2006. In the game, the player takes control of a hacker named Satoru Amatsubo. The game features hacker-themed puzzles where the stylus is used for program repair, password cracking, and other digitally-themed technology heists. Project Hacker plays like an adventure game outside of these puzzles, with the story being comprised of dialogue interactions between you and a large cast of characters, along with the aforementioned point-and-click observation gameplay across the game's environment. The game never officially made it out of Japan, with its planned English translation and localization being cancelled by Nintendo of America due to copyrights being filed against its packaging and instruction booklet. Interesting. While I don't necessarily find the gameplay of the game to seem too gripping, I think its atmosphere is actually calm. The music, while not anything crazy, I think creates a pretty chill atmosphere to match the anime hacker visuals. And from the visuals you're seeing on screen right now, you have to at least admit the game does look somewhat aesthetically appealing. But yeah, the game was never localised, so we'll probably never get a chance to play it really. Number Battle 
Sujin Tyson Number Battles, or just Number Battles, was a 2009 DSiWare title developed by Mitchell Corporation and published by Nintendo. The game is a miniature version of the full game Sujin Tyson, which was released in 2007 for the DS. Both games are puzzle and strategy based. The game plays similarly to Dominoes. In each round, the player places a tile on the game board, which ranges from 1.5, also featuring paths on them. The objective of the game is to place the tiles on the board so that the paths join and the numbers create sequences, which are called hands. A path on a tile can either be one way, meaning it emerges from the center number at one side of the piece, two way, meaning it runs through the tile, either straight through or turning in the middle, three way in the shape of a T, or four way in the shape of a cross. Really, your objective as the player is to score as many hands as you can with your tiles, while also blocking off your opponent from doing the same. Sujin Tyson features online play through Nintendo Wi-Fi between two and four players, as well as a single player mode against CPU opponents. Apparently the gameplay is hard to learn at first, which I can imagine, but becomes fun and addictive after you've wrapped your head around it. With such monumental accolades as being the 471st best-selling video game of 2007, I can imagine we are all desperate to try our hand at some Nintendo number battles after being awakened to this hidden gem of the video game industry. Magical Star Sign Originally released in Japan as Magical Vacation When the Five Planets Align is an RPG game for the Nintendo DS developed by game studio Brownie Brown. It's the sequel to the Japan exclusive Game Boy Advance title Magical Vacation. It was released in Japan and the United States in 2006 and was released in Europe the next year. However, Nintendo Australia did not publish the game in Australia and New Zealand as it expected low sales of the game. Why? Well, let's get into what the game actually is. Magical Star Sign is an RPG, as I said, a very niche one with a small cult following. The game thematically centers around astrology and has a strong focus on just generally cosmic planet-related mystical elements. For example, the combat in the game, which is traditionally turn-based like most RPG games, actually is affected by the alignment of planets in-game. The position of the planets within the game affects the amount of damage wielded or received by each character during battle. All characters in the game are associated with a specific planet, and their magic attack power is boosted when a character's planet is Position favorably. There are seven different elements in the game, light, darkness, fire, water, wood, earth, and wind, which each correspond to a planet in the game's fictional planetary system. A game mechanic item thing called the Astrolog tracks the movement of these planets, which move clockwise around a central point as time passes within the game. The story of the game pursues the protagonist Lassie, who sets off in a spaceship into space to investigate the disappearance of a teacher, Miss Madeline, from her Academy of Magic, who was sent to deal with the antagonist Master Kale and his evil space pirates. The hero of the story pursues Lassie in another spaceship, but is forced to crash land on another planet. The player must reunite with the other five classmates, rescue Miss Madeline, and derail Master Kale's evil plans in a wild journey across outer space. So yeah, it seems like a fairly interesting little Magitek themed RPG experience. And I think its aesthetic and use of spaceships and magic across a cosmic setting and loads of different planets is actually pretty cool. Not to mention its character designs and use of colour, which make Magical Star Sign seem even more appealing. Marvelous. A first-party puzzle platforming quasi-RPG title released for the Super Famicom in Japan only, 1996. Marvelous Mohitotsu no Takarajima, or Marvelous Another Treasure Island, is a game often credited as a spiritual successor to The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, with it both gameplay-wise and stylistically carrying a lot of the same elements, given it uses the same game engine. In the game, you take control of three young boys, Dion, Max, and Jack, which you can switch between at will in gameplay as they all have different characteristics to be used in different situations. On a field trip to an island which is rumored to be the home of a legendary pirate treasure called Marvelous. The course of their field trip is suddenly diverted as a gang of pirates come onto the island in search of the treasure and their teacher gets kidnapped. So it's up to the boys to solve all these issues, discover the treasure and so forth. And a puzzle platforming adventure across a pirate island ensues with many quirky puzzles, characters and activities coming up along the way. The game also saw two special versions be published for the Satellaview which took a focus on stamp collecting. Those being BS Marvelous. Marvelous Time Athletic and BS Marvelous Camp Arnold. Hajimari no Mori. Famicom Bunko Hajimari no Mori, or Famicom Pocketbooks The Forest of Beginnings, is a pack Sofnica developed a Nintendo game released for the Super Famicom in the July of 1999 exclusively in Japan. It was one of the last video games that pack Sofnica ever developed. Nintendo published the game and would re release it exclusively in Japan for the Wii's Virtual Console. Nintendo was hoping that the game would become a series, though, due to it being released exclusively on the Nintendo Power System and also around the time of the N64's release, its sales didn't make that a 
viable goal. Again, similarly to Yuyuki and Shin Onigashima, the gameplay is based around selecting commands through dialogue interactions and cutscenes to further advance the plot and progress through the story, with many text-based minigames throughout. The game features a nameless boy who decides to take a train to see his grandfather at Kuzunoku Village after his school vacation. Behind the railway tracks, he meets a mysterious girl in a forest who he then befriends, W. Riz. The boy, after losing her, sets off to find her on an adventure, interacting with various people along the way. While the gameplay might not be anything groundbreakingly complex, I think the aesthetic of the game is something to behold. Just how quaint and atmospheric it is. I mean, with moments like this, musically and aesthetically, it is kind of sad Nintendo never made this into a fully-fledged series. I'll let this segment play out now, and please try your best to just soak up the atmosphere of this game, because I think this moment is really significant, and is a testament to a great series that we unfortunately never received. <laughs> Kurikin Kurikin Nano Island Story is an RPG game developed by Media Kite and published by Nintendo for the DS in 2007. It's another creature collector and battling game, but is much more distinct and unique and is far from a Pokemon clone. In Kurikin, you play as a student at Nano Academy, a school on Nano Island, an island that's home to around 100 different species of bacteria. These are the selling point creatures of the game. To collect them, you must use the stylus to absorb a small amount of living matter in certain areas around Nano Island, like plants, dirt, water, and artificial objects. When one is found, the bacteria can be raised and then used in battle. Sometimes when two different species of bacteria touch each other during battles, they create a new species. The format of the game's single player story is that of 24 chapters that each start off by giving you a mission. With your goal set, you head off on a search of the island to speak to people and gather information. As you advance through the missions, you'll end up getting in battle with rival bacteria. The battles here are where the game becomes unique and honestly quite interesting. You don't battle other bacteria with menus, attacks, moves, abilities and items, but in real-time group-based wars of bacteria. You control a large group of your tiny bacterias as they go head-to-head -head with a swarm of your opponent bacteria. You can use the stylus to separate and direct your army during the battle. Some battles have the objective of having to defeat all of the enemy bacteria, in others, you just have to have more troops standing than your opponent by the end of a time limit, etc. It's honestly a pretty unique take on the creature capturing and battling games we're used to. I think it's a shame a game so unusually charming never saw a sequel or even a release outside of Japan. Make 10. Make 10, A Journey of Numbers, is a puzzle-solving numbers-based maths game, pretty much. Developed by Studio Moo Moo and published by Nintendo for the DS in 2007, Make 10 is a game that is basically exactly what the title says. The game starts with the player character visiting a lonely library tucked away in a village and finding a book full of numbers. The player character becomes so bored that they fall asleep and wake up to find a pair of pixies beside them. Pixies in this game are these little square-headed number guys. The pixies ask the character, do we make 10? You can say yes or no. Once the player character has given their answer, the pixies whisk the player away to Numberland, where the rest of the game takes place. The king of Numberland asks that the player search throughout Numberland and find the nine Make 10 Masters. The gameplay of the game consists of either navigating the overworld of Numberland and its different areas or playing the main meat of the gameplay, the Make 10. There are over 30 different games in Make 10, with literally every single one in some way requiring the player to make the number 10 out of other numbers. The game's aesthetic is pretty cool and surreal at times, and for a seemingly basic of a premise as create an entire game about making the number 10 is i think the devs did a pretty good job through space through Space, also known in Europe as Through Space High Velocity 3D Puzzle, is a 2010 WiiWare game developed by Keys Factory and published by Nintendo. In the game, players play as a block known as a keydron and use the Wii remote to rotate the keydron so it will fit in gaps in walls that approach it. Players can choose between six possible keydrons, which you can rotate and spin like a 3D Tetris block in a stage to quickly readjust to the oncoming space you need to fit through. You can also speed up how fast your keydron moves to get through the space quicker, but of course that comes with the natural risk of rushing too quickly and 
and smashing the Keydron into the wall. There are multiple difficulty levels, each one changing Keydron to become more complex shapes. Occasionally, crystals appear in gaps in the wall, which will give the player bonus points when collected. Players play for a high score. There's two different modes to play, normal mode with regular stages for you to complete and an endless mode. I personally like the sound design and aesthetic of the game. I've heard people say it looks too clean and somewhat sterile, which to be honest, it does. But I don't think that makes it any less compelling to look at, considering you'll be devoting your visual focus to the spaces and keydrons anyway. Through Space received above average reviews and saw no successors. Trace Memory I have no clue why this one is so low on the iceberg, but it's here so it shall be explained now. Another Code 2 Memories, known as Trace Memory in North America, is a point and click adventure game developed by Sing and published by Nintendo for the Nintendo DS. The game was first released in Japan in February 2005, with releases in Europe, Australia and North America following later the same year. Players take on the role of Ashley Mizuki Robbins, a 13 year old girl, as she searches for her father who mysteriously went missing in 1994 on the fictional Blood Edward Island. While exploring the island, Ashley also Super friends D, a ghost who has lost his memories. D is only visible to Ashley and wants to learn the truth behind his death. Together they enter the Edward Mansion, each looking for answers to their own questions. Gameplay is point and click as I said. The top screen of the DS shows the 3D environment you're navigating through and the bottom screen is used for all sorts of touchscreen activities and puzzle solving. Ashley has a device in the game called the DAS or DTS in North America which allows the player to save and load, read messages in the form of DAS data cards and examine photographs. AKA Ashley has her own Nintendo DS Yes, in a game which is just preposterous. The game saw a sequel for the Wii in 2009 called Another Code R, A Journey into Lost Memories, which takes place two years after the first game, with the graphical enhancements and 3D environments you can expect from a Wii sequel to a DS game. Both games are actually seeing remakes on the Switch with Another Code Recollection, which is both the games put together with Switch graphics, and it's scheduled to come out, possibly before this video's release, in January 2024. Tank Troopers. Also no clue why this is so goddamn low, but hey ho. Released as an eShop title for the 3DS in 2016, Nintendo's Tank Troopers is a third-person 3D shooter game where you pilot tanks. Yes, unbelievable, I know. You drive your tank around 3D environments and you can shoot other tanks while aiming through your periscope if you like, and using the bottom screen's radar or map in 3DS tank warfare. The game includes more than 30 unique customizable tanks to select from. You battle it out with up to six opponents across expansive maps with lots of destructible elements. You can augment your tank and recruit different troopers to enhance your mobility, increase your attack power, etc. With other wackier power-ups like shooting paintballs to block your opponent's vision, freeze attacks, and other more Mario Kart-like abilities. The game features a local wireless multiplayer mode in which up to six players battle each other in either team-based or free-for-all battles. The game also includes a single-player mode featuring 30 different stages, each with a unique challenge. Honestly, this game looks fun. I think this premise is just perfect. It's fun, wacky, explosive action that really should easily be a recipe for success. I think Nintendo ought to bring this back soon make the map bigger and make it a battle royale with 100 tank players because realistically if they did that right it would be amazing. Teleroboxer it took over 140 entries of this iceberg for us to reach the first and only Virtual Boy title on here. Teleroboxer, developed and published by Nintendo and released in 1995 as one of the 22 releases for that strange console, is a first-person robot boxing game. It's set in the future of the 22nd century, where new types of robots called Telerobotics have been created by humans. These robots can perfectly imitate the movements of humans and have been controlled and designed in order to perform tasks that are not normally achievable by humans on their own. By creating a tournament that pits two of these robots against each other in a sport called teleroboxing, Dr. Edward Mackey Jr. has found a way to spark interest in teleroboxics, therefore creating the fictional sport of teleroboxing. This resulted in the creation of a teleroboxing world championship. Q.U., the unnamed protagonist, a young boy presumably, trying to climb the ranks of the championship, fighting other teleroboxer fighters, and rising up to become champion. Gameplay has you fight with your teleroboxer called Harry, very robotic name there, against the opponents by punching your way through five rounds, trying to reduce your opponent's strength meter to zero to defeat them, which results in them being KO'd. Each round is a minute long, and if both fighters are still standing by the end, then whoever has the most strength wins. After you complete the game and become champion, you are just faced with random opponents to play against. Critically, the game wasn't received all that well, with this use of the Virtual Boy's 3D being called poor and ineffective, and that super punch out was just a better experience, with Teleroboxer's gameplay apparently being able to be summarised to just punch, 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 and nothing awfully nuanced or complex. And overall, given Teleroboxer is one of the most obscure forgotten Virtual Boy titles that wasn't even critically successful, I don't reckon it's coming back for a grand return anytime soon. X. 
Here we are, the final entry, what should be, and to be honest, probably actually is, the most obscure entry in this entire video. Going simply by X. X was released in 1992 for the Game Boy. It was developed by Nintendo and Argonaut Software and released only in Japan. It's a game meant to simulate space combat. The player assumes the role of the VIXIV starship, as it must protect the planet Tetamus 2 from a mysterious race of aliens. Gameplay involves completing missions assigned by the Training Academy coach. The the gameplay is played in first person. The VIXIV must complete each of the game's 10 stages, referred in game as objectives under a time limit. Objectives range from protecting a base from enemy fire, delivering a load of cargo to a certain area, or shooting down formations of enemies. You have a radar at the bottom of your screen containing your location and the whereabouts of any nearby enemies. The VIXIV can fast travel to other parts of the map by entering large openings found in certain places, with gameplay taking place in a long series of tunnels. Completing objectives awards the player stars, and up to 10 can be awarded. A certain number of stars is required to complete each mission, and should the player fail to earn enough, he or she will be forced to restart the mission. It's one of the very few Game Boy games to attempt three-dimensional graphics. X initially received mixed reviews from critics, being praised for its impressive technological accomplishments but criticised for its high difficulty. Retrospectively, it's been remembered and acclaimed for its historical importance and gameplay. A sequel was released 18 years later in 2010, with the DSiWare title Xscape, which features the same three-dimensional spacecraft flying and shooting gameplay play with updated fully realized three-dimensional graphics and color. Players control a commander who has returned to his home after a decade-long tour of duty. However, an evil warlord has taken control of the entire planet, forcing the commander to take control of an enhanced version of the same spacecraft from the original game, the VIXIV. In Xscape, the commander visits 20 different planets as well as completing a number of main missions and side missions. The graphics overall feature heavy virtual reality aesthetics and are very abstract and geometric, with no real complex detail or realism. The sequel and final installment in the X series released a generally positive critical reviews, with some criticism for its controls and visuals here and there. And that concludes the Nintendo series Iceberg Explained. And that concludes three months of work. I started this video on October 12th, 2023. It is now January 25th, 2024. There it is, the video is up. If any human being is actually listening to this outro right now and has actually watched the entirety of this video, then thank you, thank you, thank you. I really honestly hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you encountered a Nintendo series or two you didn't know about before watching. I don't know when my next video will be released, or what it will be about, but I promise it will be produced to a high standard of quality regardless of its subject matter. But I think that's about all I have to say today. I have been Mr. D, and one last time, thank you, thank you, thank you for watching today's video. See you in the next one.